Okay, so so selamat pagi, a very good morning to our respected lecturers at FSMP and FPP. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Kenneth and you all know me and today we will be conducting the road show. Now, I will just share my slides so we can get some context to the road show. Okay, so, so this is the road show which we conduct every um, beginning of each semester at each faculty. Now, the purpose of the road show is multiple. The first one is to identify the problems faced by the lecturers with regard to the learning management system. And we will then convey this uh, problem, these issues to the JTMK and we resolve them at that level. The second one is to inform you regarding the various other element of the uh, e-learning portfolio at UMS, which is the MOC and the OER. So these are the element which we cover in the roadshow. So we can start now. We will start and I will ask Nora to commence the recording. Yeah, so today we are joined by uh, Ms. Nora. Nora, she is in charge of the admin of the system and also Puan Eugenia will join us later and she will uh, speak about the OER and the MOCs. So, and the system has hanged, sorry. Please excuse me for one second, the system has hanged. Nora, can you hear me? Nora, can you hear me? The system hang for a while. Yeah. I can see okay. now, now the slide. Okay, thank you. So we want to start projecting it hangs for a while. So that's one of the issue which we face with WebEx. Okay, so today's, uh, uh, today we are going to look at the UMS learning management system itself. So those most of you are very highly experienced in the system, but there are some issues which may need to be resolved. So we look in the system itself. The second one, we look at the criteria for audit. So again, um, Nora, can you please share the link to the PHP server in the chat box? So Nora will share the link to the PHP. Please bookmark that link and store it with you. So at any given point in time, you can always access that PHP link. And unfortunately, it can only be accessed on UMS network within the campus. So if you want to check your audit, you need to do it on campus. The other one is the OER repository. I think you are all familiar with OER repository, but we will request, we will show you the system itself and we will ask those of you who have not registered to register now so that Nora can process your registration immediately. And the last one is the MOCs. Okay, these are what we will be covering during the course of this roadshow. Now, please um, let us know if you require specific training because this roadshow is only brief. If your faculty requires specific training, please inform us. We will give you a specific training on some element. For example, there is the gift file format. If you need specific training on that, we can give you training on that as well. Okay, so now what we do is we follow the flow when we are doing the setup. So when we start our course at the beginning, the first thing is we restore our old course into the system without the username. The next step is registration of students, then assignment of student to group, then comes the rest of the 1732. So that's basically what we do with the system. So the first step logically is to restore the course because you do not want to upload each and every content all over again, and that takes a lot of time. Then we have other features in the system itself. One is the quiz. Now, quiz is one of the issues which most of the lecturers face because of the, um, the uh, it says, you cannot hear me. I got a message in the chat. Can you, what's in the chat window, please? Uh, we can hear you, but removing your mask will make it uh, clear. Oh, okay, okay. I'm in a public space actually in the, I'm in the bio. It's, I can speak without a mask, but if somebody comes in the lab, right? Because I'm in the, in the bioinformatics or the informatic information technology lab. So if someone comes in, I have to wear my mask. Okay, so, so 
what we have is the smart uh, V3 system. I just switch off my chat. Okay, so we have certain features inside, such as the quiz, grading, and the links to content from OER, communication via chat, and Moodle Mobile Plus, and forums and discussion. I will touch upon all of these. How many of you actually use the ICAN format for quiz? There is something known as a ICAN format for quiz uh, questions. Do any of you use it? You can just reply in the chat. Okay, I will cover that ICAN format, which will make it easier for you to create questions in quiz as compared to creating questions uh, in the system itself. Okay, then comes the analysis of student behavior and learning behavior basically. So in the system itself, I will show you how to use the analytics to identify students who are lagging behind and those who are not making progress in your course by identifying their patterns of interaction with the course content. Now, MOC is another area. We will cover this in the second part of this Taklima today. And I would like to congratulate the Faculty of Food Science and Nutrition for proposing four MOCs. Uh, as well as the PPST. So they have one MOC and these MOOCs are currently being reviewed and they will be displayed, I will show you. This is actually our dashboard for the UMS MOOC. We call it UMS Learning Space, you have to finalize the name. And these courses are actually going to be um, displayed here. So congratulations to FSMP and Dr. Adila for uh, convincing uh, academic staff to develop this MOC. So once this MOC platform is ready, we will launch it and then the MOOCs can be accessed directly from the platform itself. Now, whether you wish to charge for the MOC or is entirely up to the faculty, but the platform, we will have it ready for you. So students can access the MOCs from this particular uh, portal. The other one is the OER. So OER is a repository which we have in UMS. Those of you who are familiar with it. It's a place where you can store all your content, including your lecture notes, as well as other non-copyrighted material. Now, the advantage of the OER is that you can use that to store all your content for future use and for distribution. Now, please do not store material on the OER, which you do not wish to share with the general public for reasons of your own choice. There may be reasons, for example, you may have copyright on that material, or you may have other issues related to sharing content. So please don't share any content which is not supposed to be shared in the public domain. Now, very briefly, I will go through the process of the MOOC. Okay, so those of you, and then we will go into detail with this later on. Now, you will ask me what exactly is a MOOC. So for those of you who have worked with MOOCs earlier, a MOOC is actually a short course. Okay, it's called, the, the word MOC is Massive Open Online Course. Now, the, why they have used this terminology is because when MIT developed all these MOCs, they were designed for the global audience. That's why they call them Massive. And then they are open, means everyone can access, irrespective from where you are, as long as you have an internet connection. And they were certified courses. So in the e-learning workspace, what's happening now is that knowledge is no longer being delivered as a course, entire course. It's being delivered by what they call bite-sized pieces or modular for approaches to learning. So that means that suppose I want to learn a course, I want to enroll for a course, but I just want to take one learning outcome. I don't want to complete the whole course. I can do it either in the form of a MOOC or a micro-credential. So these uh, learning objects or these learning uh, components are becoming increasingly used all over the world. And the KPT wants us to adopt this trend. Now, suppose you want to develop a MOOC. Is it very difficult to develop a MOOC? The answer is yes and no. If you want to develop your MOOC on your own, de novo, for example, you have a interest in photography and you want to develop a MOOC on digital photography. So that will require developing everything from the beginning. So I would suggest to you for your MOOC, because we are all academic staff, please use your existing course to develop a MOOC. So how do you do this? Okay, you have 14 weeks of instruction. You can take any four weeks of instruction, the four lectures, and convert that into a MOC. So that's a four week, which will incorporate, for example, one CLO. Generally, by the rule of the thumb, for MOCs, we use one CLO. 
Okay, we don't exceed more than that because that would not be a MOOC anymore. So one CLO, four to five lectures or 15 minutes each, and one assessment via a quiz. And the entire process of MOOC is actually automated. You don't have to worry much about once you uh, set up a MOOC, the entire process is automated in the sense that once the student completes the MOOC, you can actually go and check your logs and you can obtain the output and then issue the certificate. But the MOOC itself has to adhere to certain quality standards because otherwise the KPT will not want us to have any kind of content online, which is not like um, it should be proper content, should be pertinent and relevant to the subject. So what we do is we have a course template. We have shared this course template with the uh, e-learning coordinators and this course template is has to be filled in by the lectures. Now this course template is not a very detailed course template like table 4.2. It's a basic template which covers four weeks and gives you the idea of the course. Now the course template has to be reviewed by two reviewers who are appointed by the Center for e-learning and after the process of review, there are certain recommendations which are made. It's normal peer review process like just as an article in a peer review journal and you improve it and then we launch and deploy the MOC. Now this entire process is dependent on how fast the reviewer reviews it and how fast you can actually deploy it on the system. But once you have a MOOC ready, we will actually create what is known as a course instance. A course instance is just as you have your regular course, you will have a MOOC course in the smart uh, UMS system and then your students or who, whichever uh, faculty members or alumni, they can access that MOOC and they can undertake the MOOC, you will get a record of data. I will give you an example of this later and how the system is set up. Okay, so that covers the content which we'll be covering uh, in today's roadshow. I will go back to the uh, roadshow dashboard itself, what we have here, and I will go back to the MOC course. Now, the first thing which I want you to do is to go into your, I will uh, repost the link. Okay, I will repost the link because it makes it easier for me to explain things to you when you actually engage with the course. So I'm going to repost the link here and you can click on the link and you can enroll for the course. Okay, you should see the link in your chat window now. Okay, so please uh, click on the link and enroll for the course. And then I will go into the details of this um, enrollment and certain precautions which you need to take, especially when you're teaching a very large co course, a very large cohort of students, which involves multiple streams, actually. So you have a common subject and then you have multiple students coming in and then you'll have issues. So there are ways to resolve this. Okay, now this is the course. So we can see our users now. So we have four registered users. Okay, so when you're in the process of registering, I'll go through some of the things which you need to set up in the registration itself so that you don't have overlap of users. Okay, so one of the things which you do is you go to users here. You, I will zoom briefly, so hopefully it does not hang. I will zoom. So you have here, you go into your dashboard here, your course administration, and you'll see users here. Okay, in this one, you have different kinds of options. Okay, so you have permissions and enroll users and so on and so forth. I'll go through them one by one. The first one which you have to set is the enrollment method. Now, if you have a class of 20 students, it's okay, or 30 students, but if you have 100 students, then you won't know who's enrolling, who's not enrolling, and you'll have to keep checking the log files. So what you do is you cho choose something known as self-enrollment. Okay, now in the self-enrollment, you need to create a custom instance name. Now an instance is basically a um, prompt. It's a prompt which tells the, uh, so enroll, and then you put your course code here. So this, co this code can be your course code. So I just put an example of that. You don't have to follow exactly what I do. You can just call it register, course code, and so on and so forth. You allow existing enrollment, which means those who enrolled earlier without a password can still remain in the course. 
Okay, but if you don't want this, you can close it, but then everyone will have to re-register. You allow new enrollments, yes, and this is what you need to give, which is the enrollment key. Now, I'm going to give you a very simple enrollment key, A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this is the enrollment key. Now, this is what you share with the students when you want them to enroll for the course. So, only those students who have the enrollment key can actually enroll for this course. Okay, now, you'll observe this, is that once... I'm going to share it in the chat because everyone who joins this course after this will have to use the course code. Okay, so I'll just share it in the chat. And this is the key ABCD1234, and that will be your enrollment key. Okay, now you have this one is default assigned role student, or you can make them as teacher, and so on and so forth. The enrollment duration, if you don't want the students to enroll after the second week, you can enable this. If not, don't, uh, don't do that. There are other uh, parameters here. Usually we don't change that because sometimes students may enroll late and they may be blocked. Okay, so these are all the... Okay, now this is one parameter which you can set. Is suppose your course, you have received, uh, you have checked your SMP and you have 30 students in your course. Then you can set this as 30 or 31 or 35. Don't, if, because anyone else enrolling, you will be flagged and they will be blocked. Usually we don't set this, but if you want to be stringent, you can set this. And this is the custom welcome message, which is generally thank you for enrolling for the course, etc. You can give in a message and you can also attach a video from YouTube or your introductory video over here. Okay, you can add, add some kind of a welcome method and then you add method. So once you have said this, now from now onwards, from this instance, that's why we call it an instance, from this point onwards, Everyone who registers for this particular course will have to use that ABCD1234. So, this uh, essentially makes sure that nobody else will enroll for your course other than the intended students. Okay, that's, that's the first thing. I hope this is clear to you all because this is one of the problems faced by lecturers who are teaching, for example, Plum's courses, and it's used exactly in this way. So, I'm a student from first year, I will enroll for your second year. For that course, the second year in the course. The reason being is because I want to extract all the assignments and the um, the examination, and then I will use them, and then I'll unenroll. Okay, so to prevent this from happening, we recommend that you use this method because it's based on the continuous feedback from the lecturers. Okay, now the next one is something known as the permissions. Now again, this is based on feedback in which lecturers reported that students unenrolled from the course somewhere in the midway, either by mistake, intentionally or unintentionally. Now, that creates a problem because of your course file. Your course file will become blank with regard to that student. There will be no data because once they unenroll, all the data is volatile and it will be lost. So, what you do is you need to go into permissions. Okay, I'll just go back to course administration here. If you have a problem with your block, you have to unhide it. Sometimes lecturers will say we cannot see this block and then you have to unhide. So you go again, go to users. Okay. And if you go down, there is something known as permissions. This is the permissions one. So you click on permissions. And then in this, you will see a lot of permissions. Okay. I will share a screenshot with you so you don't get confused. So there are a lot of permissions which you can give to the students. You have control over your course. Okay. So... Now, there is something which is related to the permission. Okay, I have to go down, down, down. Okay, I will share the screenshot with you later so that you can reference this because it's a huge uh, set of permissions. Okay, so here you have to go to manual enrollment. Okay, now this is a manual enrollment, and here you can go down and you will see unenroll self from the course. Now, for this course, I have not set it as unenroll self from the course. And I want you to try, try you to try this out later. I'm going to disable this and you then you try and unenroll from the course. You will not be able to unenroll. Okay, so I'm going to do it now. So unenroll self from the course and I click here, student. I take away the permission from the student and I remove. Okay. So that means from now onwards, no student can unenroll from the course. So your problem is resolved with regard to the data loss. If you want them to, if they want to un unenroll, they have to approach you and you can manually unenroll them. Okay, so this is one of the things because at the end of the day, 
okay, as lecturers, as academic staff, we are accountable for the MQA course files and so on and so forth. So to protect yourself, please ensure that you have said this. If you want to uh, do enroll again, you, there's a plus button here and then you can allow roles. Okay, so you can give non, uh, non editing teacher, student, guest, etc, etc. Okay, you can attach, you can restore the roles. It's it's a default, but as a good practice, we just unenroll. Uh, we just uh, disable that for students. Okay, so once you're done, you're here. You have many other functionalities. Uh, please don't modify some of them because some of them are related to exams. And this is, I just share the screenshot with you later, so you know what it is, and you don't unenroll or do something which is going to compromise your course. Okay, so that's the first thing. Okay, now you have created your course uh, in, uh, and you have backed up and restored your course. We will go into that later because I want to cover some other functions related to the enrollment itself because we need to get the enrollment clear so that the students are all comfortable in their learning environment. Now, in the course, you can actually create groups. Okay, so this is a group feature. In the users, you can create groups. Now, creation of groups is entirely at the choice of the lecturer, but we will also show you on the functionality which allows the students to create groups among themselves. That has been done by Puan Salmi. Puan Salmi has asked JTMK to add some more, more of the plugins so that it's easier for you to work with the students. Okay, so in the groups features, there's a group here, so you can see those who have Okay, so we have everyone registered here. So you had you have groups, okay, and you can create groups either by manual creation or you can create create them automatically. If you want to create manual groups, you have to create groups manually. Okay, so you can create the group here, and you'll have to give the group a name, an ID number. So I create a group. Uh, for example, I create um, group one because sometimes lecturers may want to create groups based on the different CLOs or different, maybe different topics and so on and so forth. So group ID number and you give it a number. So G1, and then you give a group a description and you have an enrollment key. You can give them this key if you want them to click and get a enrollment for the group. So they'll have to click and get an enrollment key. So I just give it A, B, C, D. One, two, three, four. Just give it a name and then you can put a picture here for the group. Sometimes you want to put in an emoji or a picture. So that's just cosmetic and then you save changes. So now you have created group one. So you'll have to create the groups, group two, group three and so forth. Okay, so this one says lots of things. Uh, okay, so. Uh, hashtag, so you need to put in some alphanumeric, it has a some rules, okay? So this has group one. So you can create group two and group uh, and so on and so forth. Now you can add or remove users from this group. So you can add, click on here and you can add, you can add users to the group. Okay, so I add and I can add and just click and add and so forth. I just add randomly, okay? So, right. so you can create group one and you can, so you have groups and you can create group one and group two and so forth. But the other one is you can also do what is known as a auto create groups. So auto create group feature assigns students randomly. So you get a mixed uh, distribution of students. So you can give them a group, group one, and you create number of groups, or you can have, for example, we have few few um, registered users. So we just create two groups. Okay, and then you just, you click here and then you submit. So now you have created uh, group A1 and group B1. Okay, so group A1 has these members and group B1 has this member. So suppose you want to remove members, you can just click here and then you can add or remove members. So this is one of the features which you can use for grouping for students. Now you have to take note that once you create a group in the assignment, if you assign groups, only one member of the group can submit the assignment. That's the limitation of the group. Okay, so for group assignments, only one member can submit and it will override the other members. That's about the grouping. Okay, now suppose you don't want to uh, impose your will on the students and you want them to assign the groups themselves. Okay, in this case, you turn your editing on 
And in the first week or whichever week you want to set up the groups, you can add an activity or resource. And in here, you have something known as group self-selection. Some of you may not be aware of this because this is newly introduced inside. Puan Salmi has requested these to be included because it enables the students to choose their own groups. Otherwise, students will want to change groups and uh, they will again approach the lecture and so on and so forth. So we have this group self-selection. Okay, now here you create a group self-selection. So group select, just name it and give it a rules, some rules of engagement. So you don't have um, uh, like a bytes in the system. So you just create some rules of engagement, display description on course page. Now this is what you need to set. So you tell the students you will only be allowed to create groups amongst yourself from so and so to so and so, for example, 15 to 18. After that, it's closed. And then you have um, all groups, minimum members per group, maybe three, maximum members per group. You need to set all these parameters. And Okay, so you can assign a supervisor to groups, but usually um, you will have to assign it every, at every instance, okay? And you have the common modules setting and activity completion. Now, this activity should be uh, done by the students manually. So, we give the students the right to choose the group, but we limit it to a certain date. So, you, ex you have to enable this. So, expect completion on, for example, 17 March means the students will know they have to complete on a certain date. Usually, we give a tag for this group select one. Okay, so save and display. Okay, so okay. Now we um, once you enroll for the course, you will have a group, and then you can select that group. Okay, so you enroll for the course, you can select your own group. So you can click here, and you can choose or select a group based on your choice. So the lecturer is not involved in this selection anymore. It's the students who choose their group. Now, if the students want to leave the group, okay, again, they have to ask your permission because once they enroll for the group, they have set their group. So all their friends, whatever they have set up, their competencies amongst themselves. So then again, if they want to switch the group, again, they have to approach you. Okay, we don't give that choice. We, we assign the group a setting only for a certain period of time. Okay, now I'll add an activity or resource. The next one which we can do is the chat. Okay. Now this chat feature has also been added newly because earlier what was used for chat is the WhatsApp and then it goes, it goes beyond the uh, classroom hours and so on and so forth. And then lecturers also have to have their own time to focus on content development and so on and so forth. So we can limit the chat for lecture one chat and you can keep the chat open only for a certain while. Okay, so for example, your lecture one is from 9 to 11, then your chat will be open from 9.30 to 10, or maybe from 10 to 10.30 to get a, uh, a mid-lecture assessment of the progress of the lecture. So you can do that. So you need to state that in the description. Okay, so how many times, how many messages they can post, etc. Now this is displayed on the uh, course page, and here you can do your chat session for the next session. For example, you can have one chat session per lecture. Okay, now why is this important for the purpose of audit? Currently, we are following 1732, but in the next phase of the audit, we will have to follow what is being adopted by other universities, uh, that is the 40, 40, 20. Now, in that, a certain component involves interaction. We have to keep record of interaction. So one of the ways in which we create, uh, keep record of interaction is via the chat. So once they've done their chat in the system, you just have to uh, print it out and that's your documentation for interaction in the particular course. Okay, so you can have your chat, so save, never delete messages, so that it's there for your course file. And you can do an activity completion. So this one you can set as complete when conditions are met. So you can put a condition on the students, please participate on in the chat and you will you will be graded based on that. But we need to set the rubric for that as well. Okay, so we call it chat one. So I call it chat lecture one. Now you'll see that we are always having um, uh, tags. Uh, I would suggest to you to do, do this tagging. 
because the tagging will enable you to go through your course and find out things which you have missed out on. Okay, so for example, you want to go to chat, then you have to scroll through the entire course. You can just search through your course window for this particular chat, and then you save and display. Okay, now you have a chat window here, so you can try it out. You can just click on that chat, and you can try and chat the in the system. Now, where will the chat notifications come when you're offline? They will come here. You will see a balloon here. So you will see these two uh, dots. So if there's a chat notification when you're online, you won't see it here. Now you, I won't see any chat. But if you click on the chat notification when we, I'm offline, the notification will come in this balloon here. So you will see it here. Okay, so you can see some chats is from the previous Taklimat. Okay, so everything is here. It's not deleted. Okay, so that's what you see here. Now, I would suggest to you again to use the Moodle mobile uh, app. So use this one. I will just Google it so you can see. Okay, I would suggest that you use this. Go to Moodle uh, at your Android or your Play Store, and then you will see this Moodle app. You download it, you install it, and you can log on to it using your same user ID and password, and you can communicate with your students here. So some of the lecturers are using this Moodle app uh, as a communication tool for the students, and the good thing about Moodle app is that everything remains on the record. You can always print it out and store the information for your course file. Okay. So there are some limitations, but it's okay. So. This is what we recommend that you use. Okay. okay, now that you have added the chat and the group select, you can add the first topic. So as you all know, this is done by topic or by week. One, and then you can add your, so just enter and then you're done. Now, the first thing which you obviously do, those of, because we are all experienced, so I'll just highlight it again, is your course synopsis. So click on this button on this specific icon. Edit. This is one which is missed out by most of us because because we are engaged in the teaching and sometimes we edit as a file itself. Okay, so there should be no dis so you can add your intro here, intro and CLO, and then from here you drag and drop your file. So I'll just drag from the file. Okay, I just add. A table for, and then I save it as course synopsis. Okay, that's fine. Okay, and then here you can do an activity completion, which is show activity is complete when conditions are met. This is to ensure that the students actually download that course synopsis. So you have a condition set for that. All right, again, I give it a tag, so it's course sin. Okay, save and display. Okay, so the course synopsis will be given here inside the system. Okay, the rest is um, the rest of the content which we do is generally related to the lecture notes itself. So we generally we add a lecture resource. We will add either file. Uh, so we add file. And then we have then this is generally a PDF file. Or as I suggested to uh, the respected lecturers, please um, use the OER as a link. Okay, so if you have an OER as a link, you need to set these parameters and upload a file here. So I'll just upload a file. And okay, so I just add and so slides. So whatever I'm showing you is actually in the system itself. You can download it and reuse it or remix it for later use. So you add an activity or resource. Generally, the other kind of activity we can add is a URL. So if you have a URL. You can link it to your UMS OER. Okay, we'll just go to UMS OER first. And I will show you how it's easier to use your lecture note as OER in the OER itself. 
Okay, so I just go to OER, I log into my account. So those of you who do not have an OER account at this point in time, please register for the account and we will help you to complete the process of registration so that you can upload your content here. Now, suppose I want to create uh, OER material, right? The thing about OER is that it's a sharing platform. So that means once you deposit any content here, anyone else can use it. For example, I want to use a lecture from Faculty of Tropical Forestry. Okay, I can, or I can want to go to Faculty of Food Science and Nutrition. I click here and I can uh, go to a lecture and I can use it. Okay, so th the thing about uh, using this kind of lecture is that you have to assign the attribution. Okay, so I, let me go to, for example, I have e article is here. So oh, there is e note as well. So e notes is zero. I just go back to my my lectures so that I don't use somebody else's. So I just go to so. okay. So here there are some e notes. I just put as an example. So let me see. Okay, so there is some lecture uh, note over here. So I don't have to keep on uh, reusing or keep on posting my PDF file every time because it uses system resources. So what all I need to do is need to go to my roadshow. I go to URL and I edit here and I call it lecture two. And I put in the external URL here. Now this URL, it will go to the OER. So the student can access this uh, handle. They what they know as a handle. It's called, it says a handle here. Handle refers to the link wherever they are. So you put in a description here. So lecture one, you can put in introduction and display description on course page can display is embed and you have activity completion always said this and you have a save and display okay so that will be lecture one of course you won't see the embed here because it's going to link to the oer repository and you but the student can always click and download the lecture here so this is the way you reduce the system load you just insert links now you want to insert a video you can add an activity or resource and include a YouTube video and so on and so forth here. Usually we add, um, the most common thing which we do is we add the URL to the WebEx or the um, uh, the uh, synchronous classroom here. So we just we add the URL here. Okay, you can also add pages. Like for example, if you're having a blog, you can add a page from the blog here. So it'll link directly to the blog and other packages. Okay, we don't have this. LMS content package. Some lecturers have told me that they do the external tool here and they will link the attendance to this external tool. Okay, so when the OBE system is back online, I think it will be back online. You can actually connect here using an external tool and you can link to the tool URL. Okay, so that will be your attendance. Okay, and then here you can have your tool URL here which means that this will be your link to the OBE system for attendance. Okay, so you have the tool here. I won't do it now because we can't do it. And then you have activity completion. Of course, you have to mark it as complete when conditions are met. Okay, so that's a tool here. So you can add an external tool to topic one. I won't add now. I just add a random URL. This is not accept. And you save and display. I just added a tool. So you can attach the attendance here as an external tool, which means that it will go to an external tool. Okay. okay. Uh, I think there's a question. Uh, one second. Uh, Dr. Denzai Chaka. Uh, uh, not yet, Dr. Dennis. Download all annotated PDF feature. We don't have it as yet. We have asked JTMK, we'll convey that to JTMK. I, I know because last time you had uh, uh, the question related to the system itself and you wanted to download all your PDF files. So currently we don't have that. So I will just ask the JTMK, we'll remind them when we have the meeting with them uh, for the, we generally have an executive meeting and then we will invite them and we'll assign and uh, give them all the issues related to the system. So we will raise that issue with the system. I will note that. Nora, no, please note that again uh, regarding the download all the annotated PDF files from the assignments. Okay, doctor. Okay, just so we bring it for the next meeting. 
So thank you, Dr. Dennis, for reminding us again. Okay, so you have all the content ready. Now comes the um, quiz, which is the most, uh, how do you say, challenging when it comes down to, I just open up a quiz, uh, I can format for you. Okay, so, so when we are creating a quiz in the system, we actually have to go through a big process and it's very time consuming, but there is a format which is known as an I can format. Okay, I will just pull up my um, notepad file. Okay, so this I can format is done using notepad. Just pull up my notepad file and go to my desktop and I will show you what is an ICANN file. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the file which I'm sharing with you? It's a notepad. Nora, can you see? Can you see the file? Or Not yet, doctor. Not yet, doctor. ICANN quiz file? No. Okay. No, 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 none. None? Okay. Because it's in a different format. Okay, I will do something for you so you can view the file. I'm going to attach it in the uh, in in uh, the system so you can view it and what and understand what it is. I then add an activity or resource. I'll call it a file. I add it and I will call it an icon file. Okay. In file. Okay, so you will go to your file, you will, you can go to your system, you can go and then there's a something known as ICANN. You click on that and I will show you what is the ICANN format. Actually, I just, I'll have to refer to the web page. It's easier to use the web page format. Okay, I'm referring to the web page for the Moodle LMS. Okay, now, what is this ICANN format and why does it make our life easier when it comes to quiz? Okay, if you see the quiz setup, I'm going to show it to you uh, just now. You will see that you have to uh, uh, fill in multiple parameters inside, like what is the cutoff, the grade, a score, and the and the you know, boundary, and and then many of those things can be very confusing to lecturer because you need to set each and everything individually. Now, what we have is something known as ICANN format. Now, with ICANN format, you can create. You, I've shared the notepad with you, a notepad file. You can create content in the notepad file. But please make sure that you do two things. One is you give it a dot text extension, which means that you call it quiz one dot txt. And the second one, use utf8. Okay, that's a utf. When you see notepad, you will see utf8. I will show you what it is uh, when I share the notepad with you. Now, what is the format for ICANN? You should be careful with what you use because the utf8 encodes the content in a certain way and you will have a problem if you miss out even a dot. So this first one, I will just highlight, okay, is, will, is the question. Following this, you have A dot, you can only use this one, B, C, or D, or you can use parentheses. This dot can be parentheses, okay? Be careful with that. And this will be your question, A, B, C, and D, and this will be answer dot dot D. Okay, so this means the correct answer is D. If it is the false or true, you can put answer and then you put that thing over here. So that will be, so suppose you have A and B, true or false, and then your answer will be B, which is true or false based on the question. Now, this is another format which you can use. You can use any of this format, but when you put up the two questions, make sure that there is a gap. This is important. You have to click the enter key and then create that kind of a gap here. So click, uh, Strike enter once, you get a gap, and that will create your ICANN format. Now, this format is stored in a notepad file. It's very simple, and you can import it directly into the quiz. Okay, I will show you how it's done in a step-by-step -step way. There is another format called GIFT format. GIFT format is slightly more better than ICANN. It is an intelligent format. So, in GIFT format, you can, uh, for instance, you can uh, fill in the gaps. Okay, but to teach you GIFT format, I'll have to go through the coding because the GIF format is usually quite complicated to code. So lecturers will not find it uh, good. I mean, it will not, it's not convenient. Okay, there, there is a GIF format here, so you can actually use the GIF format as well. And the GIF format is good 
but yeah, okay. I won't go into the GIF format now because it will require training by itself, but the GIF format actually uses a UTF coding, okay? So these are the symbols. So that means you have to learn all the symbols all over again, and then that is going to be like texting, okay? So I don't suggest that you use GIF format unless you have specific applications, and I can provide you a training on that because this will require about uh, two to three hours to train you into how to use this particular formatting. Okay, and then the other advantage of ICANN is that you can create it offline and you can upload, uh, import it online. Okay, so you don't have to be online to use ICANN. Okay, let's look at how we actually use the ICANN here. So this is the topic two, and I want to create a quiz. So first I have to create the instance for the quiz, which means creating a quiz. So you create the quiz, so the quiz is called quiz one. These are the rules and the rubrics for the quiz. If you have negative marking, you have to state it here. If you have a one attempt, you need to state it here. And then you have to display description on course page as always. Timing is the setting for the quiz, the time. You usually enable this and you enable the time limit. Okay, I'll explain to you how the system will actually work in a, with, in a student's PC or in their laptop or, or their tablet or phone. Now, the student is using a device which is running with its own clock. And the JTMK server is running with its own clock. Now, suppose these two clocks are not synchronized because of the network issue. What, what will happen is that the JTMK clock will run and then your student's uh, system will not run in sync with that. In that case, the student will say, get a message saying that the quiz is already completed and then they will appeal to you for and so on and so forth. So this one is a common issue reported by many lecturers. If you are on the UMS network, for example, in the Asrama, you, you will generally not have this problem. So uh, you have to be cautious with this when you enable the time limit for the quiz. Now, there's a pro and con for that again. If you give it a too long duration, the students can plagiarize, they can copy from someone else. If you reduce the limit again, you're not being, uh, in terms of cognition, you're not going to help them anyway. So. It's it's a it's a you need to address this carefully. Okay, you need to judiciously. What do you say? Okay, so after the time expires, you are you have to basically go to you and they will have to ask you for a password again. So you have a grade, and you have a grade to pass. You can set a grade to pass, and you usually block this as one attempt. Okay, and then the grading method is the highest. If you set this at two, three, then you can have a highest grade. Usually, it's one for quiz because it's a, uh, you have layout, okay. This is another setting again, which you have to see the practicality of the uh, system and the time and, and the network. Now, suppose I have 10 questions and I have 10 questions on one page. What this essentially means is the student will see all the 10 questions in one go, on one single loading. Now. In terms of, again, you, again, judicious use, because if the student sees 10 questions, they, they may get cognitive overload. Okay, if I selected one question per page, which means that every time the student answered one question, it will move on to the next page. Now, this will reduce cognitive overload, but again, the student will have to access the network again and again, and there's a chance that there may be issues with connectivity. So what we suggest is you select be reasonable and you select these questions, 10 questions per page, so the student can see all the questions one go. Again, from experience and other people's uh, input, right, what happens is that if they have 10 questions, they can actually screenshot and they will share the question and they will share the answer. Okay, so this actually is based ultimately on the integrity of the student. So to avoid all that, you can actually shuffle the question, but if you have 10 questions and you have one page, again, shuffling becomes the issue because they can see everything in one go. You get deferred feedback. So this one is um, every time the student answers a question, it will sell, tell them yes, uh, correct or wrong. And you have review options. This one usually we don't, we set by default. You have appearance in the grade and overall restriction. So if you want to prevent restriction, you can actually give a password here. Okay, so you give a password. Okay, now, uh, what this means is that the student, if they want to re-access the, um, the quiz, they will have to actually ask you permission, and then you'll have to give them a password, and then they will re-attempt. So this can be done in cases where 
the student sincerely really has a problem with accessing the quiz, their network connection is lost, or in the end kampung and they don't have connectivity, you can have this option for that. Okay, there are other things. So usually for activity completion. Okay. And you can select other things such as tags. You can give it a quiz one tag. I won't do that now and I will save and display. Okay. Now the quiz is created, but there are no questions for the quiz. So usually what we will do, we will go here and edit quiz and we will attach the questions. Okay. Now there are two ways you can add the question. We will go through both of them. Some of you may be. Um, okay. okay, thank you very much for typing who has done that. So, okay. Thank you, Eugenia for helping with the chat. Okay. So, uh, one Eugenia has kindly uh, put in the instructions in the chat. So you can see the. Instructions for how to use the UTF-8 and the encoding with the ICANN. So I will show you both the ways. So those of you who know, please bear with me. So those of you who don't, uh, who, who don't have knowledge will learn from this process. Now, this one, right, is very important, maximum grade. Because the, because I will show you the reason why the grading is important. Inside this um, LMS, there's a grade book. Okay. Now, what happens at the end of the semester or the end when you are doing before our marks endorsement, we have to download everything. So sometimes we have used multiple tools. We have used, uh, for example, quiz with one tool, and then you have used uh, the uh, LMS for another assignment, and then it becomes very problematic to correlate all the data into one Excel file. What the system has is a grade book, but you need to set the grade book for all the formative assessment by setting up the maximum grade. For example, in my uh, Quiz, right? If my maximum grade based on my table 4.2 was, for example, 20, I can set this here in the maximum grade and then it will set at 20. Everything will be scaled to 20 marks. Okay, so let's see how you add questions. So you can click here on the add button here, add, and you can add from a question bank or you can add a random source. Let's, I'll just add a new question. So you are given only these many choices. Okay, some of the lecturers had asked sometime last time. Can a student scan um, like an um, uh, image and upload it here? You can upload it here, but the system will not be able to identify the uh, image, whether it's correct or not. Okay, So you can, for example, you ask them to uh, draw a, uh, an engineering diagram and upload, and then the system cannot judge. You will have to manually check those. Okay, so what we do is uh, we have the, we select the basic one, which is multiple choice, and then you add. And then you will see the amount of uh, of the parameters which you have to fill in, and it's a lot. So you call it uh, quiz one, quiz one question. So this is the question for that. So the student will not see this. This will be only for you to see. This will be the question. Uh, what? Uh, so this will be true or false, right? So I just use. Okay, so we just use just use the simple one. So default mark is one. So the general feedback, you allow only one um, answer, and then you can give it a grade. Okay, so if it's a one, you can give it a grade, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can select your choice. Uh, yes, so I just put here yes, and then we'll say no. So choice two will be no, and one. So, and then you can see no, it gets none, and then you can put under choice, it depends. Okay, so up to you how you grade them. So once you do everything, you can give it a feedback and then you save changes. Now, this is a very simple question. So if you need it to set all the feedback, which means that if the student gives uh, the true answer, then you have a certain feedback, false, you get, then you need to set all those. But the other way to do it is to import your ICANN file. So I just click here, add question, and you have a question bank. Okay. okay so let's go to data. I think you may not be able to see this. Okay. I go to my question bank. Okay. One minute.
Hang on, okay, the system a bit slow here. Let's go to my question bank. Question bank. I import from question bank. Okay, I have my ICANN file here. So I click on the import. Okay, so I'm, uh, you all may not be able to see the notepad. Okay, I'm going to click on import. And I'm going to click here on ICANN format. Okay, so you go here to import and your ICANN format. Now, if you all, are, you all have uh, the file which I shared with you, you can try it on your own system. Okay, so you can, here you import. So now I'm going to import a file from my icon format one second you may not see it because choose file and you can press because when i opened a notepad you could not see it so this is icon one so it's fine Port. Okay. okay so now it's importing the file and i continue so it imports everything basically in the file. Okay, now you can see that this was the question I created earlier. Okay, and this two are the ones which I imported from the file. So these are from the ICANN file. Now suppose I had made a mistake in the ICANN file. Suppose there was a dot missing. The questions will not appear here. They will, um, be, by default, they will not be seen in the system because that format is not recognized as ICANN. Or well, suppose I did not use UTF-8. Suppose I use the other encoding ASCII and uh, other uses, it, again, it will not in, appear here. So now we can have all these questions here and we can add them directly to the quiz. Okay. So I just have my question bank ready and I go back to my course. I go back to my quiz. And you can edit my quiz once. And my quiz is ready. So you'll have to do this at every instance, every time. Okay, I'll just attempt the quiz. So I need to have the password, which was there in the system earlier. And then I can do it because I've already opened the quiz. So you can attempt the quiz, but because I've, because I've already opened the quiz once and I have put a password by default, I will not be able to open it for the second time, even though I'm the teacher. Okay. So that's how you create the question bank and you add the question to the quiz. Now let's add another activity or resource. I'll create another quiz. So I create a quiz again. Okay, and we import all those questions into the quiz. So I call it quiz two. Then I give a description. Okay, I won't put any uh, passwords here. Save and display. Edit quiz, and then we add all the questions. Okay, so I have the question bank here. I add all the questions here. So just add everything, and you can add them to the quiz. I added here, and now your quiz is ready. Okay, I save this quiz. Okay, so under topic two, you can see the quiz here. So this is the one which, this one I have not put any kind of password. So you can attempt it as many times and you can try out the system. Okay, so that's about the quiz. Are there any questions related to this quiz? Is it uh, difficult to adopt or any other question, anything related to quiz or anything which you may have encountered with regard to the quiz when you delivered it to your students? Okay, so you can post in the chat and I will respond to it. Uh, Dr. Dr. Kenneth? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, this is regarding the icon uh, format. Yeah. Um, some, sometimes it is, very, as you said, uh, sometimes it is very difficult for uh, uh, the system to recognize because of the uh, space, the dot, and, and uh, how, I mean, how we put it 
uh, in 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 the in how we type it in the in the in the icon page yeah. and yeah. therefore some some when we import it so it won't be this way so it it is is either missing or or it does not come out for example uh, what you have uh, shown here uh, mm -hmm. answer uh, uh, that dot and then space and d uh, by mistake uh, we put uh, answer that dot and then d without space so it mm -hmm. wouldn't come out uh, in it wouldn't uh, come out uh, as it's supposed to be in the um, quiz page so uh, I think uh, we need to be uh, to pay quite um, uh, pay more attention on how to place the dots and the spaces uh, yeah. in between all these things yeah yeah mr i mean that is that is the only limitation with the icon format because it's Correct. actually looking for these spaces and this if there is a i have not tried without the space but usually i just follow exactly as it is it has but sometimes lecturers have reported there was one lecturer who did everything perfectly but for some reason it would not work probably yep. because of the encoding on his uh, computer is different maybe because he didn't maybe have not used utf8 so we tried to help him but it just simply could not work because mm -hmm. maybe some small dot something which is missing in the system right nora you remember you remember nora will remember that yeah i'm i'm, I'm having I, I had that problem before <laughs> so uh, sometimes uh, it 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 takes us a longer time to type the whole questions uh, one by one one by one in the quiz but this save a lot of time definitely uh, using i can save a lot of time uh in uh meaning to say we just type it in in icon and then import it in in the in the quiz so we have the bank of questions here with us uh at the same time so which is good but then again another question is how are we going to select certain question only to be appeared in the in the quiz from the icon okay you can do that uh, uh mr actually i'll have to create another quiz because um yeah, so it's like that. So you can import only certain questions. Let me create another quiz to answer the questions. I just I don't want to override uh, some because some of the quizzes may be active. So just create a quiz. Yeah. Somebody may be clicking on the quiz. So I don't want to override it. So I'll just create a new okay. one. So three. You can actually import only specific questions. So this. Yes. For example, in the, in our question bank, uh, icon question bank, we have ten questions: one, two, three, yeah. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. Yeah. But we only want to have uh, question number three and number four, while the rest okay. we okay. don't want to be imported. So you click here, add from the question bank here. Okay. Let me try this out, and then you can only select these two: one, two. Okay. okay. The remaining you leave. So you add selected question to the quiz. Okay. Hope it will work. There, there are two in the quiz. Yep. So then you are yep. done. Yep. So you can okay. select only two and you can shuffle and if you want to shuffle them you can actually click here yep. so that will shuffle the so the students will not see both on the same page but quiz is actually very tricky because of the yeah one of the, the problem is that suppose 100 questions and you give 100 minutes sometimes it will lari means run and then we'll have yes to yes it it is um it is challenging for doing quiz here but the advantage is you will get everything in the grade book itself. Correct. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Kenneth. No, no problem. Actually, you all are much more experienced because you all are using it all the time. So you all know the uh, problems inside the quiz, right? Usually we have only fewer students, some of us, and then it's not really an issue. But if you have hundreds of students answering the quiz simultaneously, then sometimes the issue does come up. <laughs> okay. so. We add an activity or resource. I'm just going to add an assignment uh, because just to show you the grade book. I want to show you how the grade book actually works. So that one saves again. The grade book saves a lot of trouble. And if you set it up at the beginning of the course, it's actually going to help you during the marks endorsement and so on and so forth. Assignment. Okay. So I call it assignment and then I have a description. I just want to show this for grade book. Okay. So I just show it. This is also what Dr. Dennis mentioned about the uh, download all the uh, graded reports. So it's currently the feature is not enabled in the system. Okay, I just set up this one. Okay. Now, in this one, there is something known as a group submission settings. Okay. So 
if the students submit by group, yes, you remember I created the groups, then only the one person per group can submit at set, uh, the assignment. Usually we will, uh, usually it's individual assignment, but if it's yes, then it's this one and require groups to make a submission, it will be yes. Okay, so I just change it for now, I'll make it no. But what we need to check is this one grade. Okay, now the grade uh, point, okay. Now suppose you are uh, working with a uh, table 4.2 and then your assignments, you have two assignments, each assignment carries 20 marks. Or one will be some laporan for the uh, Amali or uh, laboratory report and then you want to give that 10 marks or you have other Latian industry and you want to give. So now you can actually set the grade here. Now with this one, you just follow the table 4.2 and then scale it to this. So that makes your job easier. For example, this assignment had 20 marks. Okay, and then I have all the tags and then this I'm not going to click on now because I want to focus more on the grading part. Usually it's conditions are met and then you save and display. Okay, now what's going to happen is this one. I will go back to the grade book. So, easier to uh, go back, you know, because I'm afraid if I re-click, it may hang. So, there is something here known as the grade book set up here. So, in your administration, you will see your grade book set up. Now, this is what uh, those of you who attended the training, right, uh, which was done earlier, you can actually see we had a blended learning training. Some of you have attended that BL training under COL. So, that one, uh, the trainer had emphasized the using the grade book. This is why you have it. So, you have attendance and then so on and so forth. You can actually assign the grades for each of this. Now, what happens is that the assignment one has so and so, so many marks. You can assign these grades, okay? So, out of 10, out of 150. So, you can edit these grades, okay? You can edit them from here. For example, attendance, you have um, maximum grade is 100, minimum grade is 0. You don't want to grade it. You can just delete, okay? Assignment for that. And you can adjust the weightage. Now, once you have set all these grades, for example, you have quiz 1, 10 marks, quiz 2, 10 marks, and then you have assignment 1, assignment 2, midterm, and so on and so forth. Everything will appear in one grade book. And at the end of the semester, whenever you want to have your marks endorsement, all you do is click on export. You export it generally as an Excel spreadsheet or an XML file. Usually we use Excel uh, spreadsheet because you can convert to CSV and, and then you can use any other open uh, ODT, uh, open uh, document for editing this. So, you can export all this. For example, I don't want attendance one. I don't want quiz one, quiz two. I want quiz uh, three. For example, I give some quizzes which are not going to be graded. They are just for the assessment of the learning outcomes uh, on the basis of the lecture. So, it's sometimes we convert, uh, have a pre and post lecture quiz just to determine how much the students have learned. So, in that case, you want to exclude that quiz. You can just exclude it. Then you have your assignment, you can have your midterm and your course total and you click on download. Now what it will do is it will download the course, the graders report in the alphabetical order or numerological order as you want. Now this one is actually going to enable, uh, I would suggest you to do this because it will save you a lot of time when you are trying to do your compilation of mark. Okay, so that's it. So this is the grade. So the grade book is actually here. Now we have not, uh, no one is engaged in the course, so uh, no one is uh, engaged, mean no one is accessing the material, but usually it will be, it, you will see it here. Okay. So you can see everyone's grades here. Then you can sort it out. Okay, you can sort out by surname or first name, and then you can download it. So up to you how to you download it. So this one will be useful. Are, are all of you using this um, graders report or is is it not being used? Do you all use this? Anyone using grade, grading uh, grade book? Any any problem you face with the grader report? So if you are if you are not using it, please use it, and you'll and uh, it'll basically improve your efficiency of uh, when you do your reporting. Okay, so there are many view, uh, many of the options here. You have the grade history, outcomes, and overview report. Usually, we only want the grader report for download at the end of the session. Okay. Now, we have all, once we have all the systems in place in the LMS, okay, there's a chat. I cannot read the chat. Uh -huh. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, okay, you can, you can, Dr. Ko, can you ask? You just ask, no problem, because I cannot see the chat window. All right, okay, good morning, Prof, and uh, to everyone here. Thank you so much, Prof, for sharing uh, this is useful information with us. Actually, I have two questions. Number, yeah, yeah, sure. number one, uh, number one, uh, I use sometimes I, I use sh short answers mm. for the quiz. All right. Sometimes the answer is just one word. OK, for example, what theory proposes, blah, blah, blah. OK, if, for example, when I see the answer, uh, even if it's one word in the uh, let's say uh, I started uh, with a capital letter, if, mm. for example, the students gives uh, give the answer, uh without without for example uh, without uh without the capital letter at the be beginning of the word then the system will give them a zero for that that answer even if the answer is correct that means i had to uh because this happened to me before i had to uh go through all the answers manually and to 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 edit the uh, uh and to mark the the questions mm -hmm. so how to avoid this this one does oh. this mean that we cannot for short answers, we need. Um, I mean, I don't know. What 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 do you advise? Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, it's Doctor Asma, right? Uh, okay. Thank yes, you, Doctor Asma. Actually, um, um, the thing about this uh, the system is that one of the limitation is that it's case sensitive. It it will actually follow the case. Now, in the case of uh, this kind, it's uh, specifically related to short answer. So the other option would be to use what is known as the gift format, which is again uh, more <laughs> complex than the um, I can format. Okay, so in the Moodle format, if you need instructions on how to do it, I can do it for you. So usually for short answer, we have this. Okay, so you will need to set this up in the system. So you will have to have, for example, the keywords. Uh, then they will have to be combined together, and there is a you can actually select. Based on, for example, this is Ulysses S grant, and U is smaller. You can actually give an option for more than one choice. Oh, okay, otherwise, it will uh, by default. So this one requires the um, programming in the GIF format, Doctor. I'm sorry that I cannot uh, I cannot uh, like change the setting because by default it is going to set for the case. Oh, I see. So by case, so the other option. Okay, I'll give you another option for this. But this will not be related to short answer. You can actually give more than one correct answer if you do multiple choice. Okay, I will show you how it's done. So suppose you have a, I just call it quiz. I just need to create. So just for the sake of default, uh, this. Okay, now one of the other one is to add MCQ. Okay, so random question so you create a new question so you refer to this one right uh doctor this one the short answer right yes yes there may be other options so question number yes for example uh, so so this will be done let me try option because Okay. I ah, see this is actually here. Case sensitivity. Now mm -hmm. case is unimportant. Yes, case must match. Do you use this option? Yes, yes. I, I use the, the first one. Case is unimportant. Yes. But it still gives a wrong yes. answer. Yes. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. Even sometimes, for example, if uh mis I mistakenly add uh dot at the end, if if yeah. the CDM, for example, didn't add that dot then the system yeah. would give him uh, zero. This is the only option which I can give you, doctor, is to allow yeah, this it. Is to what do. I did so this will be. Yeah. This, oh, you did yeah. this the same. So, but yeah, it's going to add to I, I, yeah. because, yes. because how many possible yes. combinations can you have? You can't, for example, this one will be the exactly. third one. And then, then yes. you, so the, uh, the answer is to actually, um, Okay, so the, 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 I think we should, in this case, right, you should inform the student to uh, use uh, case sensitive because, uh, if, if, for example, in this case, obviously, I have to use the case sensitive text, doctor. Mm -hmm. That is the limitation of the system, doctor, because yeah. it's quite um, lim uh, limiting in terms of the um, uh, correctness. It wants everything to be correct, precise. Yes, true. 
So I'm sorry about that, but we can't actually modify this system. I, I will ask, I will ask my colleagues later because there may be some options, but as far as I know, uh, that is the only thing which I can, I will get back to you, to you via the, uh, the e-learning coordinator, doctor. I will just check with my colleagues in the network. Okay. The, see, yeah, the, okay. the component of learning network to see for the, thank uh, you, yeah, thank, thank you, you very okay. much. Thank you. Prof, I have, I have an, another question. Yeah, sure, for you. sure, sure. Please. If, for example, like now the case of that question that we see here in the screen, you mm. created this question as a new question. Okay. For example, uh, if I want to use this question next semester, when mm. I want to import it from the uh, the question bank, mm. I, I I couldn't do that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, doctor. Okay, so what you need to do is you need, there's a function called backup and restore. Do are you using this backup and restore function? No. 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 Okay. Okay. I will go and it's good. It's good that you raise up the issue because I think many of the lecturers uh, may not be aware. Thank you very much for raising Thank it up. You, okay. So what we will do is actually it's the next thing which I wanted to do is to uh, after I do the grade book is actually the backup and restore. So we are at the right point in time. I will just go back to my. Okay. Now. Uh, as a good practice, because in blended learning, we have something known as the good practices, which we follow, like they are like standard operating procedures and we do it for 2 reasons. 1 is to save our time and the 2nd 1 is also to ensure the integrity of the course and the course file. Okay. This is what you should do at the end of the semester. Upon completion of the 14th week, when everything has been done, all the formatives have been done and summatives, uh, summatives, of course, you cannot do it here because we cannot disclose the summative assessment to a student. What you need to do is you need to click on this button here, backup. Okay. Always do this. Always create a backup file. By default, JTMK will create a backup file for you in the system, but please don't rely on that because you will have to look through that for that file. What you do is create the backup, I would suggest to you download a copy in your machine in your laptop or your desktop and then you will um, you upload it into the google drive okay create okay. it and then it's good for your record okay now what you need to do is the first backup okay in the first backup what we do is include all the information including the enrolled users now this file right when you download it will not be in the format which you can open with a computer you have to open it only with the LMS. Okay, so this is one. So, um, uh, Dr. Dennis has some question. Dr. Dennis, can you uh, ask me the question? Because I cannot see chat. I can only see the prompt. Um, Dr. Kenneth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I think I uh, I've been facing this problem since like four semesters ago. Because yeah. when I created a assignment or quiz, and then I decided not to use it. Yeah. Uh, it the it the assessment will be uh, included in the grade book setup, and I cannot delete it at all. And then the the warning error will be there like forever. <laughs> okay, so you mean in the backup or in the grade book setting? In the grade book setting, and the, even the uh, you know uh, the grades, I cannot delete them. Oh, okay, okay. I, I will just go to that, Dr. Dennis, because uh, after I finish this, I will go to that. I will just as address that because usually you can unclick and de uh, deselect those which you don't want. Okay. Have you tried to deselect? Already done. <laughs> it still it still remains. Yeah, it's the, the error will be deletion in progress, like forever. Okay, so so that means you cannot actually imp download the Excel file with without the content still can down, download but the, the 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 it's just appear there it doesn't doesn't system. cannot be deleted okay i i will check that i have never experienced i will check dr dennis yeah and, I, 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 will, I will i will snap a, a screenshot and i i think i just I just okay. okay please please send it because we need to figure out what it is if you are facing the problem, we have to find out the solution for that problem. Okay, okay. Let's figure it out. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. So this is the backup setting. So you need to include everything here. Here, doctor, this is the reason why. 
you have to include the question bank in your backup setting. So the backup will also contain the question bank. Okay. And then you, you don't jump to final step. I will show you the procedures step by step. So you can include, for example, all this content. If there is some content here which you don't want to include, you can just delete it. Usually for the first backup, we will go to everything. Okay. And a file name is created here. You can tag this. You just copy and paste this file. You just need to know what it is because if you are backing up multiple courses, you will have multiple downloads. So you need to just uh, bookmark or note, note this file so that later on you know what it is. Again, it asks you everything. It keeps asking you this because it wants to ensure that you don't do, uh, it doesn't back up the wrong file and then it performs the backup. Now, when you click on the perform backup, based on the speed up okay now this is actually based on the content in your system okay suppose you have a lot of pdf files etc etc you will have a problem with the backup it will take time sometime may not from when you're doing it from home okay and then you continue the backup file will be created here okay now this is actually the backup file okay? i have backed up many files for different different um, of uh, roadshows but this is the backup file for today's roadshow what it does is it contains the snapshot of what's happening in this time. So that means that is why you need to back up only at the end of your course. Now, once you have the backup file, right, in your course, okay, your, your, you can click here. Okay, so this is the one. You download it. You click here, download. I would suggest you download it, make a copy in your system, and then you make a copy, you copy it to Google Drive. Okay, that is just for security, so you don't have lose that file ever again. So you back up, you download, and you restore. Now, suppose you, you are teaching the course, for example, this semester, this session. Then in the next semester, I'm not teaching that course. And then it's taught again in the next semester. You have to click on the restore button. So when you restore it, you can restore that course to the destination drive. Okay. Currently, we don't have the uh, we don't have a destination folder because I'm doing this as a taklimat. But you need to uh, delete certain things, and then you can download so you continue and then it'll ask you for your destination okay so now you have to select here so i, I have not created a file here so uh, you can uh, if you have a course code you select your faculty you select your course code okay you select a course code here and then you can back it up here so you need to select the course okay so this will be your course for example uh, you have thought the course in this semester, you want to back it up. So you need to key in your code here, you search for the course, and then we will see it. And remember, again, it's case sensitive. Okay, I just. Uh, okay. Okay, so this is actually, I just searched for a random backup restore. I don't have it here. Do I have a backup restore? I have created something known as backup and restore, but it's again, it's case sensitive. So. So, as you can see, it is. It's, it's case sensitive. Okay. So, I have something called backup course here. Okay. It's created for demo only. So, I'm going to click here on backup course and I continue. Okay. okay now, this is the course which I have created just for your demo. It's called backup course. And as you can see, it's uh, case sensitive. Now, I want to transfer this to the next year, but I don't want to include all the students. I only want the content. So I click here, unclick this one, include enrolled users. If you don't click that, what's going to happen is that your, all the students from semester one will automatically be registered in the we'll go. next we'll semester. Go with the okay, so that's what will happen. So, so you use the enrollment method, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then you click next, okay, mm -hmm. next, and then so on and so forth. Have all this data backed up, next. And I, it, it keeps asking you questions because it doesn't want to, uh, it's doing its due diligence. Okay. And then I continue. continue. Now, this is a course called backup course. So this is just a backup course. I just call it backup for your, for your, uh, for your demo. And you can see it has backed up all the contents into that course. Okay. So this is the way in which you restore the course. So generally for most lecturers at the beginning of the semester, they will do this exercise simply because it will enable them to save their time. So that's the backup and restore. Is it clear, doctor, how it's done? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, yes. So in this case, I can also, I can see the 
and uh, I can easily import the questions from the question bank. Yes, yes, definitely. Oh, all, right, okay. all your question banks will be back. Basically, all information, the only uh, information based on the interaction with other faculties, some of the lecturers will include certain kind of software package, which is dependent on the updates and time. That one you cannot uh, back up and restore it because that one is dependent on times. For example, you included some kind of a file which is um, needs an update, like a software file. When you restore it, it won't work. It will, it will basically, the system also may not restore that. Okay, so please don't use some kind of a software to back up and restore, okay, especially the oh. recent software. So that one will not work. So if you are using it, that one you have to treat with caution because, for example, you, um, you uh, backed up a file and then your, uh, the file configuration change when you restore it, the configuration will be lost. Yes, so oh, precaution right. okay. you need to take. Okay, now coming yeah, down to Dr. So, thank you so much. Bro. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Any other question you can just ask me. I will uh, try and respond to the best I know. Hi, Dr. Kenneth. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm called from FSMP. I actually have a uh, same question. Hmm. I am teaching two courses, hmm. but uh, they are coming with two different codes, but hmm. the content is the same. So hmm. if I want to set a quiz, for one course, is it possible to replicate to another course? Uh, or I need to, because they are considered two different courses. Course. How different can course. I transfer that? Yeah, different course. Sorry. Sorry. You can actually back up to both. There's no, there's no issue with that. Okay. okay. So you have course code one and you have course code two, but you want to have the same components inside, but the users are different. Uh, what you need uh -huh. to do is, before the commencement of the semester, before even a single student registers, you need to do the, do the restore step. Okay. Okay. So it's perfectly okay. You can restore because the the system does not discriminate between the content. It it will just follow your instruction. Okay. Exactly. So you can import the uh, question bank, etc., inside the file. There, there is another one actually. We can import the course from here. Okay, so you can import import the data from here, or you can import it from, uh, for example, you have you have this course, okay, Roadshow FSMP. I want to import data. I can actually import it from any of the other courses. Okay, so mm. you, you have so you create your first uh, you create your what I would suggest to you is like this. You because both the courses have similar content, right? Everything is the same, right? Lectures, assignments. Yeah, is it yes. not everything. Probably like eighty percent are the same. Mm. Some assessment may be different, but lectures are the same. So, yeah, so lecture lectures, you can import and assignment. You can assign you. So you'll only have to do the additional task of giving a new assignment in that reprogramming mm -hmm. that part. The remaining 1 should be perfectly. Okay. Okay. Dr. Kaur. Right. Okay, uh, Dr. Kenneth, I have another yeah. question. I had a uh, mid semester exam using the quiz system. Mm -hmm. And this mid semester exam is a uh, essay questions. So mm -hmm. I wanted to export the individual mark for each question for CLO analysis because uh, I have different questions uh, uh, corresponding to different CLO. But when I want to export, right, the, mm -hmm. the value is not exactly the same as the mark. Like, for example, question number one is supposed to have several marks. But when I do my mid-semester exam, it's written as three grades only. Is there something wrong with my setting that the grade is not corresponding to the mark? Okay, okay, okay. okay. I will I will show you the grade setting. Uh, hopefully, this will answer your question. Okay, based on. Okay, okay. I will go back to my. Okay, I will show this one to you. <clears throat> I will explain uh, the quiz setup. Okay, and then activity resource, and then you have your quiz. Okay, now <laughs> what we need to do is when we set up our quiz. Uh, four, I call it quiz four, and then I put this. Yes, yes timing great. Okay, now this is the one which we need to set out here, doctor. This is the one. Okay, so you have the grading layout, question behavior, appearance, and uh, I did everything. Okay, my display. Okay. This is the one, doctor. What uh, ac according to your table four point two? What was the maximum grade for that particular quiz, doctor? This one. Uh, thirty. For that, for one quiz. Oh, that it was a mid-semester exam. Okay, this is a mid-semester exam, which you're uh, which in which they answer quiz. Uh, no, they answer uh, a short essay question using the quiz mode. Oh, then how do you grade it by manually or you? Use I, I manually grade it. Okay, so 
Okay, so this one, let me try it out because usually what happens, right? For the one which is manually graded, uh, the uh -huh. quiz is actually designed uh, for automatic uh, automated grading. But the one which I we see. manually grade, we will generally give them under assignment. I see. Oh, okay. That's that's the general practice because we mm -hmm. I have not uh, seen. Uh, okay. Um, was I, okay, I, I just try it out for you for your benefit. Okay, now, it, so you actually use the essay type? Yes, I use the essay type. Okay, so because generally for this one, right, for midterm they use the um, uh, for midterm they will do uh, for example two will be the MCQ one, which using mm -hmm. this one, which is automatic grading, and then they will do the normal one using the assignment key. That's what we recommend to. Uh, the uh, so we have HTML text and changes. Okay, this is where it becomes uh, complicated because I have not uh, <laughs> we have not received any um, information regarding that. So you could grade it here directly. Yeah, I actually could grade it here but directly. You could, you, but you could not export. Uh, the I the the grade and the mark is not the same. Maybe I make a mistake because my total mark mm -hmm. is seventy six, but the grade is thirty. So now I want to export the mark, not the okay, grade. Okay, okay, so, okay, uh, okay. The total mark is thirty. The total mark is seventy two from all my questions because I have like uh fourteen oh. questions. Mm -hmm. It should comes to total mark seventy six, oh. but the grade is only thirty. Because that is the total score for the mid semester exam. Okay, okay doctor. Okay, I, I now I figured out what's happening. In that case, okay. you have to man manually scale it to that level. It has to be <laughs> manually scale. So suppose that this, this for this quiz, it's actually like this. So it suppose it's thirty questions, and each question in this thirty uh, marks, then it will actually assign that for one question. Unless you have to add the mark here, we'll have I to see. modify this one. So. For example, if you want the question mark to be for, uh, the first question, we'll have 50 marks. Okay. Uh -huh. You have to add that here. But then you'll have to scale it down here. So it's usually that is a challenging thing to do in the system. I see. I see. So now I have to manually pick it up. La. <laughs> yeah, manually. So that's what I, I suggest to you because if it's an essay type question, uh, mm -hmm. just use the format term. We will generally recommend that's what we do for all exam. We just add an assignment. Okay. okay. And then once you have your assignment, you can scale it here. You can scale it in the system by using the scale for the grade. This is what we suggest for that. So maximum grade, for example, will be 30 as in your case it was 30. Mm -hmm. And then you just scale. Then you'll have to actually scale it to the uh, 72 to 30. I see. Okay. So you can. Uh, okay. So you have a. So you'll have to do it that way, doctor. So, so sorry about that because that's the way the system. Again, it's the way the system is set up. We have tried to yes. work around it, but. Um, Especially for essay question, it's uh, recommended you use this kind of system. Is it a very long essay or is it just a short paragraph? Uh, it's, it's actually a short essay. There are 14 questions. I, I would say it's probably a short answer questions. It's like, uh, you know, questions 1A, 1B, 1C. <coughs> Excuse okay. me. Yeah. So that's the limitation again of the system. I understand so, that. Mm. Uh, it's okay. Sorry, no, it. Thank you, Dr. Kenneth. No, no problem, Dr. Kaur. I, I will still I will try I will check in the forums to see whether there is any uh, solution for that. Okay, so I will check the forum for the one is forum for the we will try to understand that from the forum because usually by default the setting is based on the question uh, grade highest grade and then everything will be scaled to that grade. <laughs> Okay, so Dr. Dennis had the question regarding the grade book. Okay, so I will just go to the grade book and okay. Now, currently nobody has completed anything, so I cannot issue any grade. So I just go to, for example, the quiz. Just go. No one has submitted assignment, right? If you submitted a blank page, I can give you a grade and then we can export. So Dr. Dennis asked about the question related to the grade. So usually you have the user report. I and delete one of the quizzes. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so in order to do that, I have to do the export. Yes, I have a. Okay, so this is what you want to do, right? So delete quiz one, quiz two, quiz three, right? 
Uh, currently, nobody has done a quiz, so. Uh, no, 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 not like this. What? Which one you mean, doctor? Uh, go to the individual okay. topics. The grades? I don't know the topic. The road show. You go to the yeah. topic. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Topics. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Okay. For example, uh, hmm. uh, yeah. for, for example, quiz two. Uh, okay. And then I, uh, okay, I think I, I want to delete this because I think I done wrong. When yeah. I deleted quiz two, uh, yeah. uh, quiz two will still appear in the grade book. Okay, let's try. Huh? So we'll do it for your benefit. So one minute, I turn quiz two, I delete. Yeah, I delete like that. You delete like that, right? Yes. Okay, let me go back to grade book now. So I uh, refresh. Will I refresh and I go back to grades book. Okay, great. Quiz two. It has um, gone, doctor, I think, from my system. It's not there, doctor. Can you see it? Doctor, it's there there or not? There. It's gone, right? Let me go back again and delete something else. Yeah, oh, I just gone. I don't know what oh. happened. There, there, there's look the warning. Okay. Uh, warning is come. Okay, one minute. I, I delete more quizzes, huh? so one minute. I delete. <clears throat> yes. Delete all the quiz. <laughs> yes, yes, and I delete this quiz. Yes, I deleted all the quiz three quiz. Only quiz three is there now. And then I okay. go back to my grade book. <laughs> Only quiz three is there, doctor. This sometimes, right, doctor, what happens is that with the system, right, sometimes if you're, I don't know why it happens because I tried to back up and restore earlier for some lecturers from uh -huh. outside UMS. And then they have the problem of that. It takes a very long time. It will keep turning, 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 and it will not give. Is this what you see, doctor? After you delete, you see some warning there? Yeah, yeah. The warning is still there, isn't it? Yes. Uh, 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 yeah. So that was. There you go. Still there. <laughs> yeah, deletion in progress. Deletion in progress is coming there. Yep. The the one yep. will not go away. <laughs> yeah, this is probably because the JTMK is maintaining this as a backup file in the server. You know this okay. uh, this. Uh, the, the, okay, it's like this, Dr. Dennis, based on the, the way the system is working, right? The moment mm -hmm. a, a student attempts any activity, mm -hmm. that activity will be assigned to that particular uh, variable, means the student is the variable until the student, if the student unenroll from the course, then it should, then it will go away. All the students by right have to unenroll from that particular uh, system, uh, doctor. Mm -hmm. Because they have already, if, if they didn't attempt the quiz, and you delete it, there will be no issue. But at this point, we have already clicked on the quiz, so that's probably what's happening in the system. Okay, okay. I, th I think I think it's because of the backup. Mm. Yeah, it's a backup because uh, so so suppose now suppose I deleted everything, right? And then, for example, here and I try to restore the course. Okay, see see what's going to happen to this. If I try to backup this course, okay, it will still have everything inside. See, it will just go to the next step. Next. Uh, the the quiz should still be the insights, so it's basically gone from the system, but <laughs> it's backed up in the probably in the server. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's not appearing, so it's not there, but it's backed up in the server. So that's why it says deletion in progress because probably it's remaining in the catch. Mm. On the okay. Server. You will ask Nora. You can uh, note that down for the uh, Mr. Avang, uh, Mr. Lamsari. So we will ask Mr. Lamsari. There, there were some issues related to that backup and restore. One of them was, uh, one of them was the um, issue of the uh, software. So that one we could not solve because the software once, if you back up a software and you try to restore, usually you cannot restore that one anymore. Okay. All right, all right. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. We will see that. So we have two issues to solve with you. One is the um, all the uh, download all the assignments, and one is the. Um, <laughs>
<laughs> so related to the great book okay so we see the you are a big problem <laughs> uh it's uh, actually we try to it's good to that's why we have the road show because we try to figure out what problems they are facing because we can only push the system until certain level but the real user is the end user is the academic staff so they will know what the real problem is being faced in the system so mm -hmm. so we we'll go back to the so that's we we try to identify it and usually when we have the meeting for the panel RS, we will solve uh, we will ask jtmk for this uh, report on the system okay, okay. thank you Thank you, Dr. Dennis. So now we come down to the reports actually for the system. Now, suppose you are in the class, right? And then uh, now usually in the online setting, it's very hard to track users and very hard to uh, find out individual users. Usually in the class, you can see them. So usually we have in the system, the uh, analytic system. Now, the first uh, thing which you can do is logs. Guess okay, so this is useful when you are giving an exam, an online exam from midterm. You can actually see or view the logs based on the exam. So you have logs. So suppose you have today, today 15 March, and then you have get these logs. Okay. Now you know everyone. So who's where and what they are doing, and you can also see their. Yeah, I will just zoom out. So this, this is actually the IP address. Okay. Now suppose. Two students are using the same IP address that uh, to answer a midterm exam. Obviously, it's suspicious. So you can actually note that down using the IP address. But then we can't really take any action against them because we have not said that in our uh, in our guideline or the Garis Pandu that you can't use the same IP address. Okay, so IP address is an indication earlier which was used. For example, which to give midterm in the uh, Makmal computer, then we could check the IP address of the student so that if any student had any conflict, they said we didn't have the, uh, for example, we gave the exam, but it was not recorded. The data is in the IP address. Okay, now that's useful for monitoring the course, but what you also have is real time data. So what you have is analytics graph here. You can see on the side here, there's something known as go to reports. Click here and then you'll see analytics graphs. Click on analytics graphs. And you'll see the number of active students, assignment, submission, etc. Now, suppose I want to check who is accessing my content now at this instant. I just click here. Okay, I select all. And we will see who's accessing the content. Okay, so this gives you an identify, so you build graph. Sometimes the system is actually working in real time, so it will take time for it to. It's actually doing the work now. Let it do its job. So what it's doing now is it's looking for information from the internet and it's looking for clicks. So it, every time you click on a specific icon or a URL, it will the system will uh, pick up that one. It takes time because it's dependent on the speed of the server. Usually quite fast. Yes, speed builder. So analytics graphs, I just check for, for example, content access, number of it. Okay, I just show you a simple one. This is easier. It doesn't require much resource. So I, we want to find out the number of active student in the class. I click here. Bit slow, but usually it'll, it is fast. Just go back. Okay, what it does, it it what this one does it, is it pulls information from the server based on the activity. So at least you can identify in your class. For example, you started your lecture in the morning, and then you got no clicks on certain on the icon, which means that nobody is actually uh, in. They are in the lecture but not engaged. So this one, the system will actually track that. Okay, so we just wait for it. Just give it some time because loading. <coughs> I think many users online, so it'll take time. Thanks. Okay, it's taking time. Okay, you just go back and I. <coughs> Sorry. Reports, analysis graphs, and I want to find out the number of active students. This is the basic parameter. Uh, now it shows you the basic. So 
This actually shows you how many students were active at eight in the morning. There were two clicks, so that's probably me setting up the system. But nine o'clock, you can see there were twelve clicks, uh, twelve active users. But these are the number of clicks. So this is the click count. So at 11, ten o'clock, uh, there were about hundred and three uh, users. Okay, so you can see. So um, you have seen uh, somebody has uploaded submission, created submission, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can track the users by simply by viewing on this. Now, this is a good thing to use to analyze student behavior in the classroom, because when you do your online class, you can actually give a quiz and you can actually track the users by using this feature. And also for the, um, okay, I look for the activity completion. Okay, so you can see who has completed which activity and the system will actually track the activity in the system in the, uh, in terms of the activity completion. Okay. Uh, you have content access, which allows you to see who is accessing content. Okay. You can build your graph. Okay, that's it. So now you can see the content. So red means the students have not access and uh, green is access. Okay, so you can, for example, if you're given an assignment and you find out that uh, fewer users are accessing assignment, you can actually click here and you can tell them, please, Complete assignment. Okay, you can send a reminder here. Okay, so I'll send a reminder and you send an email. Okay, so this will send an email to you. Don't just ignore the email, it will come into you by default. It's just a demo. So with uh, with the, with this system, right, it's not like WhatsApp. When you send a message using this system, uh, you need to wait until it says the queue. It has queued the message and sent it out. Otherwise, if you if I click on the back arrow and return back, okay, it says message sent to Moodle queue. Okay, done. So now you'll see a message in your system saying that please complete the assignment and so on and so forth. If you are using Moodle Mobile uh, Plus, you Moodle Mobile app, uh, what they call app, right? It's uh, not plus the earlier one. So if you're using Moodle Mobile app, you will see the message in your Moodle Mobile app instantly once it's put into the queue. So uh, please use the Moodle mobile app because it improves the interaction with the students. Okay, so that's about the system itself, uh, about the, all the feature of the system. There are other features uh, in the system which are deeper inside and that one we can cover in a full training. Okay, we can't, we usually don't cover those in Roadshow because like for example, gift format, it can be covered in the deeper, uh, in, a, in a full uh, flesh training. If you have any questions, I will uh, take them uh, or else. Um, Juan Eugenia, are you going to introduce the MOC? I'm okay. Uh, you're okay? You're, you're recovering or recovered? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not <laughs> Sorry, most of recovered. us still have the problem with coughing and voice until now. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm speaking, I'm not very clear. So if you can post any questions in the chat and Juan Eugenia will uh, cover the MOOC. Okay, I think the OER. Oh, no. OER is it OER, OER. or MOOC? Okay. OER, OER, okay, OER also as well. OER, first, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, I'll just stop sharing and I'll wait online. Uh, okay, somebody asked a question. Uh, one second. Uh. Um, can I? Just can I remove a student who has enrolled from your course? Yes, you can remove the student. I think it's from one second. I just Dr. Kaur has asked, can I remove student wrongly enrolled in my course? Yes, you can unenroll them directly. All you do is go to the student uh, users and then you unenroll directly. It's from the system. Okay, you have the right to do that. One second, I check. Okay. All right. So, Dr. Kenneth, um, can I start with OER? Yeah, yeah, please, please, please. Thank you. Okay. So, those who have not registered uh, in the OER system, uh, you may do so now uh, with the help of Nora. I think Nora is online with us today. So, we can just um, register yourself, um, as you can see. Um, oh, this one, hold on. I need to log out first. Okay. So there's this um, 
here you can see the word register here. So put in your UMS email address and then you click on register. So from there, Nora can help you with the uh, registration. Okay. All right. So while waiting for um, those who have not registered to be registered in the system. So for those who have um, already registered, you can just log in. Okay. So this is um, our repository, okay, UMS repository, okay. So I'm just going to show you how you need to submit your um, materials in our OER system, okay. So we have this communities and collections. Communities are the faculties, our center, and also our institute, okay. Um, when we click on this, Okay, it comes out like this. So all these, um, we call them communities. And right down here is what we call collections. Okay, so um, we can um, put in creative works, e-articles, e-books, e-notes, educational videos. Okay, so some people, when they just registered, okay, newly registered, um, they won't have um, lots of options on the collections, okay? But you can um, get Nora to help you to add more uh, collections in your, um, when you need to submit your uh, materials, okay? So um, when we want to submit, we just click on the word submission here, okay? So, um, what you see here, when you click on the word submission, what you will see here is your um, submissions from the previous, uh, your past submissions, okay? So you can see when did you uh, submit your materials here, okay? So these are the draft, okay? In case you haven't um, submit your uh, materials yet. So how do you need to start with your submission? You just click on start another submission. Okay, or just continue with your graph. Okay, so here I'm just going to start a new submission. So after that, um, you will uh, see select a collection. So this collection again, uh, what type of uh, materials that you need to submit. Okay, so for me, I'm from PPIB, so Center for the Promotion of Knowledge and Language Learning. So I just select um, eNotes because I need to submit my um, notes uh, to my students. Okay, so next. So this one, okay, you just uh, key in your uh, name, okay, last name, and then, right, so the title, okay, lecture one. All right, so this one is very important. Um, it won't allow you to proceed next if you don't uh, key in. So this one, March, okay, I picked today's date, is it 15? Okay, so publisher, if you don't have any publisher, so then we go here, what type of notes? Uh, presentation, for example. Okay, language, just put English next. Okay, so if you have um, keywords, and you just put in there. Okay, there you go. Add. Okay. And then if you have abstract that you need to put in, then you just put in there. Okay, if it's a video, then you can put the link here. Okay, so later on, they will um, provide a link for you so that you can link in your Smart V3. All right. So for now, I don't have, but this one description, if you want to describe about your uh, materials, a brief description um, is okay, all right, and then click next, and then choose the file that you need to upload, okay? So I just, uh, okay, upload, okay, and then I click next, if you want to describe your file, also can. Okay. 
All right, so this is um, a review of before you submit. Okay, so you need to double check before you submit because once you've submitted, okay, or next or submit your uh, materials, you cannot uh, take back. Okay, so you cannot remove it, you cannot delete it because it's already in the system. Okay, so you have to double check before you uh, key in uh, to the next. Um, because we have this uh, copyright uh, license that we need to um, yeah, put in, yeah? So, um, Creative Commons license, I think uh, Dr. Kenneth has already uh, informed everybody, I think since two years ago, we started with the Creative Commons uh, talks uh, from the last two years, okay? I think everybody is in the know of that. So, click on Complete Submission when it's um, you want to proceed with submitting your materials online in OER, okay? I cannot do so because um, this is not uh, the things that I want to be, uh, to be put in or published in my OER, okay? So this is just a sample for me to uh, give you guys on how to uh, submit your uh, OER, yeah, in the OER system, okay? So once you're done with that, you are done with that, and it's going to be here, okay? Lecture one, e notes, okay? So um, if you want to continue, you can just um, click on the OER, okay? It's here already, okay? But this one, it's not um, available yet, okay? Because once it's um, once you uh, put it up in the submission button just now, um, complete the submission, then it will be available uh, for the public to see, okay? So once it's already up in OER system, uh, you cannot remove and you cannot delete, okay? So um, any questions? No questions? Okay, so how do we need to put this um, OER in our LNPT? Okay, so this one um, we have to go to. Yeah. Okay, can you guys see SMPPI? Yeah, can. Okay. All right. Can see. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So um, now I'm in my uh, SAPPI already. Okay. So we go under publication. Okay. So publication V2, click on that. Um, it's similar like um, when we want to submit our uh, paper, right? Okay. So go to publication two and then start reading. Okay, and then application. Uh, okay, is that already? Okay. Okay. So this one. Okay, similar like how we want to submit our paper, huh? okay, so add new publication, okay, so here we choose general, okay, so again, we put in to what, for example, okay, search for possible duplicate, okay, so no possible duplicate found, next to proceed, okay, and then, um, here we have general monograph, okay? So we can choose um, anything that we want to um, put in. But again, um, just now I put in OER as note, e-note. So this one, I also put note, okay? So the title, okay? It can be your unit, okay? The title of the... Um, the materials that you've submitted in OER. Okay, abstract, if you have any. 
Okay, keywords. Okay, you can put in that. Um, I think the date is very important. Publication month and year. <clears throat> okay, submission year. Acceptance. Okay. And then, okay, so you can just um, ignore the uh, things that you don't have, okay, or you don't know what to put in. Okay, but accept the date. Okay, so this one published. Okay, so my writer status was order. Okay, and then in your name. Okay, and then this one, uh, you put in the link from the OER that you submitted. Okay, the link, hold on, yeah, for example. Okay. Uh, okay there's a link here so you get the link copy and then paste it in here okay so that one and then proof of submission okay and then yeah you can just uh take a picture of that uh file okay and then upload okay and then this one, okay, take this, submit for verification. And then um, just wait for it to be um, verified. If um, towards the end of the year <laughs> and you still didn't get the um, your OER materials um, verified, you can just contact Mr. ID from BSM, okay? We will update with the... Um, the rest of the e-learning coordinators if there's an a change of <laughs> if somebody replaced mr id okay so currently mr id is the one um, who's in charge of verifying all the general publication okay any questions any questions no questions easy right okay so um Go back to uh, let's uh, yeah let's come back to Mr. Uh, Dr. Kenneth. Yeah. Yeah. One minute. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Kaur. Uh, I I actually have uh questions uh regarding to this OER. So actually, I joined a bit because I have the lecture just now. Uh, uh I saw that just now. Uh. Uh. Uh, there has been a demonstration that we can upload the YouTube link video, right? Hmm. Okay, I, I'm just uh, wondering because yesterday I gave a talk and the talk is actually organized by the U Science of UMS. So my hmm. talk has been recorded and now it's available in the YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering, can it be uploaded as an OER? Uh... So I need to get the U Science approval first before I upload. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kaur. One, Eugenia, I want to answer you. Do you want me to answer? <clears throat> uh, I think that one you can answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's look at it this way. Okay. So when we create uh, any content in UMS, you are the content creator. You have full right on that content. Okay. Mm -hmm. Suppose you came to, for example, to uh, PEP, the e-learning center, and then we recorded a video in the system. Obviously, you're a content creator. You have full right over your system, Dr. Kaur. So, okay. Yeah. So the rights and privileges belong to the end user, not to the con like. So, uh, like suppose, but if I wanted, for example, if you, if I commissioned you to do a recording uh, under my, uh, for example, under Pusat, then I will have the right over your recording. But you are still the content creator, so you can still reuse that content. Okay. Does uh, that answer? Right. So you can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when you create a YouTube video, you can't upload the YouTube video into the system itself. You can only upload the link into OER, and you'll have to create mm -hmm. put up a, a thumbnail. Okay. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I think the content that I gave yesterday also relevant for teaching some of the students as well. So I think it could be reused for the in the smart retreat. Yeah, for the courses. Yeah, please. Uh, you know why I'm asking you to um, why I'm uh, we actually in PEP why we highlight this OER OER. Many times people were wondering why we are highlighting this OER. It's simply because of one thing. You know, before the pandemic, 
uh, earlier we were mostly a physical entities. We, we had a physical presence, but now after the pandemic and all this uh, thing, it's actually we have actually become digital entities. If you do the, if you see the progression of digital entity, right? This OER now you are now you are just in the beginning. After ten years later, you will see the impact of that OER because just as you have the H index, right, for all our publication and citation, the OER is actually tracked with metrics. So you will probably have maybe five or ten years down the line. I don't know. That will probably be linked to promotions and things like that. So that's why I'm saying use the OER and improve your digital footprint. Okay. That's the take home for OERs. Okay, I, I will just show you the um the uh the thing about which everyone wants to know. I just share my screen with your permission. I will share the screen. <coughs> Let's give me a few seconds. Okay, so <laughs> one second now. I just share the screen. I think it freeze. <clears throat> one Eugenia, is it freezing or is it sharing? Um, it's trying to share. It's starting to share content, but it's not available yet. Okay. So when you want to create uh, the question, which was asked was, can students be unenrolled from the course? Yes, it's a simple one click step. And can you assign a core teacher? That also is one, one click step, a one click uh, step. Okay. So we will just wait for the system to show and it's just one click. So what you have to do is you have to go to your enroll users and then there's a dashboard there. I will just wait for this system to load before. So. You go to now for this particular course, right? I have assigned most of you as teacher. Uh, I have done it when uh, Puan Eugenia was doing the demo. I assigned you as teachers. So you can go to what is okay. You open your screen and you go to enroll users on your respective terminal. And then you can see in the enroll users, the roles are given there and the uh, enrolling, uh, unenrolling uh, uh, individual or assigning a role is simply that. Not yet, right? Puan Eugenia is already is sharing. Still white screen. <laughs> oh no. Wait, I have to stop and restart. But if I stop and restart, it will again have issues. It's is it turning? Is some movement there? No. Nothing. Yes. I have to. This is the. Okay, let me just share again. Huh? This is the problem with the WebEx is precisely this one second. I just open up only one screen. <clears throat> Switch off everything. Show one screen. Okay. Chrome share. Okay. Should be sharing now. Okay. Yep. Okay. 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 So what you do is this. It's very simply this. Sorry, I didn't cover it up earlier because we were with okay so go to your course i have a course here this is our course okay then we go back to our users jelly you'll have users here users and then we have uh enrolled users okay so this will be our enrolled users now suppose i want to add another user suppose i want to add one eugenia i just go to enroll user okay and then i go to eugenia so i search for her name and I enroll her as teacher, for example, and I search. Okay, okay. Here I can see now I enroll Eugenia directly as a teacher. Okay, I finish enrolling users. So Juan Eugenia's name will appear in the system here as a teacher. Now suppose I want to unenroll. I'm not going to do it just now because some of you all may be already enrolled, and I don't want to do this. All you do is click on this one. You click on this cross here. And then you can unenroll them as a student. So basically, they will be removed from the course. But before you do this. Please make sure that you have uh, confirmed with the student and got some kind of an email confirmation that they want to unenroll. Don't do it by WhatsApp or by word of mouth. Ask them to email you that they want to un unenroll from the course, or else later on they will say they were unenrolled without their permission. Okay, so that's one precaution you need to take. Now, suppose I want to convert someone into a teacher. Okay, so here, right? The uh, associate professor, Dr. Patma, is here, so I will add him. So I will just assign a role to him. 
and I can give you my role here. So you will see here now currently is a student. I want to assign him to teacher. So I'll just assign role and teacher. Okay. So you are already assigned as a teacher in the course. So I'll assign. So you can do this for uh, almost everybody. So these are already assigned as teacher. And you can. Uh, okay. Is it clear how it's done? And then you are done. <laughs> Okay, so th this is the earlier way in which we used to do the manual enrollment. Usually now the teachers are already assigned, but if you want to assign a new teacher or if you are, you are teaching with a core teacher, you can assign them directly using this method. Is it clear now? <laughs> Any questions related to this? Um, so the can so the yeah. can yes, yes, yes. Uh, if if uh, let's say a, a course is taught by two different uh, lectures we can also uh, do the same thing like like yeah, assigning yeah, yeah. yeah precisely all you do is go to your users and then you have to just yeah. uh, enrollment method uh, enrolled users go to yeah. enrolled users first and then you can assign them so suppose you are unknown teacher right yeah. like just now i did so you can suppose i want to add um for example i want to add nora so i just add her as teacher and such so you'll have to it'll look through a big set of so you just find her name here. Uh, so there are many Nora. So it's it must be. So I just yeah. add here. So uh, uh, is, it, is it possible to do it uh, the other way around? Uh, let's say um, uh, I be uh, sharing the same course with uh, Dr. Padma. Yeah. So uh, I just enroll uh, as a student, and then uh, Dr. Padma will reassign me as teacher. Can it be done that way too? Can, can do, can do as that way as well. Mm -hmm. But then he left okay, the village okay. of the teacher and the student. Okay, so which means that he can uh, do both this. Stuff. There are actually some other tasks which are there, which are non editing teacher and all that. But usually in UMS, we don't have that. That yep. is sometimes for the tutor. If you're having tutor, yep, yep. you can do that. So that will become non, non editing teacher, maybe mm. a student who has been assigned to only view certain component. But and then there is uh, this is used by during the examination time only. Okay. Okay, so yep. that's about the, the that's about the system itself. <clears throat> Any other question related to this? Yes, system? thank you, Dr. Kenneth. Thank you, Mr. Amin. Question related to systems. Of course, I'm sure you all know all about that embedding and all that is um I won't cover. Do you all know about embedding your videos in the system? I think most of you know, right? So and it's um, okay. I will show you the basics of a MOOC and how it actually works. So this is a MOOC I created. It's open for all. You can just register it and you can uh, play around with the system and you can understand it. So this is actually a MOOC, very very simple MOOC. So it has a course description, uh, which is like something like a table for. It's a PDF file. You can enroll for it. It's called Introduction to Virus Management, and you can just go inside and you can uh, observe how it is done. Now this one has instructions. And you can see that it has videos one, two, three, four, and five, six. These are all YouTube videos. Now, what what the system has been done is it has been set up so that a student cannot view this video until they complete this video. So we have set it up in that way. You can do it yourself by using a restriction setting on that. So MOOCs are very easy to set up. I would recommend that you uh, use your existing videos or course material to create. So this is one, two, three. Four and five. That's it. Six. So you have six lectures and you have one assessment, which is a quiz. So that's it. So once they complete this, you can actually see the grade book. So you set up your MOOC to run automatically and then you can see your grade book. Okay. So you can see who has attempted and who has not attempted the grade book in the grade book. So currently uh, no one has attempted. So it's under progress. So the MOOC is generally, uh, I leave it open until a certain date. And once that date is uh, reached, I will remind the students and then I will ask them to complete the assignment and they will complete it and that's it. Okay, so that's how uh, easy it is to set up a MOOC. There is nothing so uh, special about this. This is just a normal uh, learning system. Okay, it's just a LMS based system. Okay, so that's about the MOOCs themselves. Okay, so for those of you who are interested in uh, creating your MOOC, please submit your name to your respective uh, course coordinator, e-learning coordinators, and we will pr progress from then onwards. 
Okay, any other questions you have? Dr. Adila, any question from you? Yeah, uh, I just want yeah. to ask because one of the uh, our professional uh, data mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. uh, they asked about if they become the presentation slide, kan? usually when we do conference, we do oral presentation. Can yeah. we use the present presentation uh, slide as a one part of our document for the OER so we can share with others? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That that is the purpose of the OER. You you see what happened earlier. I will tell you the ex exact case. What is happened to researchers from Malaysia going to Singapore? In Singapore, right? Whenever you uh, suppose you had a poster in Malaysia and then you flew to Singapore and you displayed that poster in the Singapore in a Pameran or the uh, like tuck exhibition. What is to happen is that once you displayed it there, it actually became the copyright of that country. Okay, so Singapore would claim that you have displayed and the organizer would claim copyright. Now, in order to do this, to prevent this, PPI had a system whereby they used to uh, copyright those posters. So, what I would suggest to you before you do any presentation or anything in the any other mm -hmm. system, you actually deposit it over here. Even a poster you can deposit here. Okay, I will go to the collection uh, one second. Uh, so, I will show you. Without how. any uh, the, the conference place in the name or anything, just the plain slide. Uh, so yeah. If you, if you want to block it, you can actually put up the conference name there. Okay, ah, so you can okay. actually submit it as the bukti, the evidence letter for your attending conference by putting it up here. But this will basically protect your your rights because once you make it open mm. in the system, uh, this system is not a copyright based system. So please don't deposit anything. For example, if you have some uh, some for example the artwork for you're doing food technology, you want to make some artwork for your food. Uh, say for example, your noodle and all that, that one you should not deposit here. Okay, because that is copyright material. So you can file for copyright. If you deposit that material here, you cannot file for copyright later on. Okay, doctor. This one you have uh, to be careful of. Dr. the call asks about the webinar presentation that can be submitted under which category? Uh, webinar? Be under... Uh, usually we submit under, so we have categories here. So. I'll just show you the category. So, uh, I will yeah, just you can show you add time. the one category here. So, uh, I simply only uh, have a few category. Okay, I just show you which I know. So, webinar will actually mm -hmm. come as educational video. Ah, okay, okay, yeah. okay. So, so webinar, what you have to do, you have to first create a. Uh, you need to create a instance. Okay, so can you do you know what is a Microsoft Stream? Microsoft Stream. Okay, so this is uh, actually there are two ways to actually um, enable this thing to be done. One is you upload to YouTube your webinar, and then you can just uh, enable it to the system. The other one is to use it in Microsoft Stream. Okay, Microsoft Stream is a free account which we all have, and you can upload all your videos here. Okay, so you can upload here. You can just log in with your go to Microsoft Stream, log in with your user ID and password, same as your Office 365 and UMS, and then you can here. Create content, you can create and upload a video here. Okay, so this is Microsoft Stream. The thing about Microsoft Stream is it's not available in the public domain, it can only be seen by our staff, our student, and our staff. Okay, that's the disadvantage. But if you want to make it public, you use YouTube. I think one Eugenia said something in the in the comment there. Okay, is it clear, doctor, regarding this? Yeah, Doctor, yeah, can, I, can I ask uh, uh, questions regarding to what Dr. Adila has been asking just now yeah. um, about the presentation? If we have attended the conference, means that the slides that we have used for previous conference is, uh, is okay to upload in OER here, yeah? It's perfectly okay. That's what we do all the time. You can upload yeah. here, the, you can upload them in the, in the e-notes. Okay, so we have the e-notes here. There are many yeah. categories here, doctor. You can use the e-notes. Okay. For example, see, I show you. I will show you. I, I have actually uploaded just for your reference. I upload. Okay, so this is given at a talk given at conference. I will show you here. It's actually available here. I, I show you. Just to show you an example, can you see this? This is actually a talk given yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so it's showing you all this. This is actually the conference. Uh, this is exactly what I presented at the conference. Oh, I see. So you can use, right. you can use this. You can use this right. as a as the basis for the. Uh, 
the everything basically we do even the FRGS report I can upload here the FRGS final report Lapuran are here you can upload here and then you can bookmark it and you can use that link in your FRGS proposal as a evidence for the upload because we give right, our final okay, report thanks, right okay. so you can actually put it up here it will appear on your Google Scholar by the way on your Google Scholar search it will appear as a as a link to your Google Scholar. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Any other question? You can post or you can, you can turn on your mic and speak as well. Dr. Kenneth, earlier, yes. Dr. Kenneth, earlier yes. you have mentioned about the about the, the new audit scheme 404020. Can you explain a little bit about that? Okay, so this is actually under Thank the you. Senate. Um, it's actually, uh, Puan Salmi has prepared the Senate paper. We are waiting for the Senate approval. But what it basically means is like this. Normally what we were doing, we are doing 1, 7, 3 and 2, right? So the 1 was the measuring the synopsis seven was the content which is the static yes. content which is all content then we had three and two three and two actually the dynamic yep. content dynamic in the sense that three is the interaction with the student and two is also there what the kpt has assigned is a new a new scheme which will be 40 40 and 20. so 40 again will be the content but 40 will measure interactive content so for interactive content this can be in the form of a recording in which you for example you have a uh, recording and then you have breakout session. Okay, so that will be you have breakout sessions in your lecture. So you have a 40 and then you have 20 for the assessment. So now this is actually um, most of the universities have implemented this already. And Puan Salmi will uh, prepare the final uh, paper for you for us. That's for us to actually translate whatever content we have into 40, 40 and 20. Now, when it comes down to the audit, right for this. We'll have to reset the system because currently we are using the PHP, which is based on 1732. So we'll have to redefine the system with JTMK to do that 40, 40, 20. But currently for this semester, we are not implementing it. We are waiting for the approval from the Senate. Okay, Dr. Amin, uh, Mr. Amin, is that okay? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. So we'll wait for Salmi. She will be preparing. I don't know whether she's here today, but she's probably, uh, we, we have uh, presented twice already that paper. One Salmi is present at Senate. Well, it's a good news that uh, we are not implementing uh, 404020 uh, soon enough. So I hope by by the time it's ready, so every, everyone will go into that 404020. I think it, it's a little bit um, uh, much easier compared to 1732. Yeah, we should be implementing it actually because yep. majority of the other IPTS have implemented it already. So we are under, uh, under their pressure to actually implement at this stage. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, so they want more. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Adila. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. It's okay, it's okay, no, no problem. I'm just talking. Uh, yeah, I just want to record. ask about the if the 404020 be implemented, can the MOOC you can use this part of the 404020? Yeah, MOOC everyone asks the same yeah. question. The answer is yes, yeah. you can use that. <laughs> Provided your MOOC can be converted into your SLT, you can use it as part of the part. So, for example, yeah. see, suppose I'm doing a course, right? Suppose I'm doing one course and then I want to implement this MOOC inside the course. So, you can see, you can you can convert the, using the formula which uh, has been developed by Puan, uh, when Puan Salmi has converted the formula based on the IPTS. We can actually convert this. For example, these are how many minutes? 15 minute lecture, right? So, you have these modules. You can actually incorporate this MOOC, for example, this so it will be week 1 to 10 will be for the regular uh, uh, content. And then you can say week uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, please uh, do the MOOC. Okay, so and then it will link to this MOOC and then they will come continue with the MOOC. So it's perfectly okay to do the link the MOOC with the uh, with the other content. In fact, that's the basis for that the 40, 40, and 20, because you can actually link to external contents, but we measure the time, SLT. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, welcome. It will save us a lot of time, actually. <clears throat> Any other question related to the system? 
anything, MOOC, OER, anything. Any other questions you may be having or any doubt you want to clear? Uh, I have just one question. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, about the chat that you mentioned earlier, if hmm. we, I do the chat, usually I do this, uh, some uh, discussion in the uh, class when we do lecture in the Microsoft team. So can I actually uh, take the, the chat discussion on the Microsoft team uh, mm -hmm. and uh, link it into the smart UMS as shown that we do have some uh, discussion on online something like that okay okay that that uh, uh, dr adila that can be done provided that you are you are going to uh, save that are you saving the file in microsoft teams yeah you are saving it in microsoft teams right yeah, the record yes. of the chat then, then it yes, should be yes. no problem. It should be no problem. Okay. But you can put up the link to that Microsoft Teams in the in the system. Sorry, yes, the computer is giving yeah, a yeah, okay. notification. So what you can do is to capture that data in the system, right? You can actually link that to the. You can add the link to that Microsoft uh, interaction in the system, so that is actually captured as uh, under some chat or other thing. What you do is you can create the. Okay the chat actually in the system okay one minute okay so so as long as you create a link it should be okay yeah because some some students actually it's quite problem because they have to open the microsoft team and then they have to open smart ms3 so sometimes they have difficulty uh, because the the microsoft team have actually used a lot of the internet right so yeah yeah so but, then, yeah. but but this is relatively easy to do because this one is the chat is very simple in this one it's using a simple interface so you can try it out now so i just add mm -hmm. a chat here and you can actually try it out by yourself you just click and yeah, yeah. Just I, click. I tried it yeah, uh, once but uh, it's because uh when i do it not all students actually go to the smart ums uh, actually when oh, you do okay, okay, okay. they prefer to do the at the actual Microsoft team when you do the our class. Oh, okay, so okay. They I understood. That, um, oh, I understood. This is actually an mm -hmm. alternative to using, for example, this is used in low bandwidth situation where the student cannot actually use the um, video and then you can have a, a lecture and mm -hmm. then you can chat with them after that to discuss the lecture, things uh -huh, like that. Okay, okay. So this is not generally used because otherwise it, I, I, I understand. Dr. Adila, because it caused a problem, right? Two, three screen at the same time, especially on mobile oh, phone is challenging. Yes, yes. Uh, but this can be used for a off, uh, offline chat. Means when you're offline, non-synchronous, non you set up the chat and uh, then you chat after the class. Okay, okay, okay. This one is after, so you pre or after? Yeah, pre uh, or post, after yeah. The, uh, Okay. Yeah, usually you can ask them what are your expectations from this lecture and then after they complete the lecture, did you meet the expectations and everyone, then you can use that for your uh, reflective note for your for the reflection file at the end of the, uh, for the course file. Yeah, usually I use the survey on the, to do, to know it's oh, okay, okay. the topic, yeah, but if you do the live chat, maybe I can use it uh, much more faster. Probably. Yeah. That should be, okay, survey also is good for one as well. Okay. Any more question related to the system itself? Or anything you want me to cover? Use URL, anything else? Nothing. Mr. Amin, do you have any other things you want to clarify? Uh, um, so far, so far, uh, um, I, I think it, it is good enough uh, for for the content that 
that you have to deliver is quite vast enough and 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 very beneficial to uh, all of us uh, to understand um especially uh, the setting up of the uh, lms uh, the enrollment aspect and and uh, those are the important aspects that we need to know uh, at, at this beginning of the semesters because uh, those are uh, the problem that uh, lecturers are always facing, especially when students enroll and disenroll, self enroll and, and all those things. So thank you very much, Dr. Kenneth, uh, for, 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 the, for the information that you have given us this morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Amin. Actually, we rely on you, uh, you all because you all are the ones who face the problem, right? And then when you all face the problem, we can address it because some of the problems we cannot actually anticipate. Like the one of the student unenrolling and all this is unanticipated but reported, and then we can address. Thank you very much for your yeah. yes, yes, uh, and and perhaps uh, uh, as a as a uh, um, uh, revision for us, <laughs> uh, uh, maybe you can just uh, explain a little bit about how to import and export uh, import sure, sure, from sure. the previous uh, years content into the latest uh, LMS. Yeah. Previous years, meaning the uh, SM uh, smart uh, learning. Uh, uh, no, I mean from uh, from content from semester two last session to semester two this session. Okay, okay. So thank you. let's start with thank you. So we will just focus on that because that's the major thing. Which so this is actually one one thing called roadshow restore. Okay, I've created this specifically for this kind of purpose where you have to demo this kind of things. Okay. Let us take an example of one course. For example, my, I go to my home and then I go to my courses and I look for one course. Okay, so I call it. Let's uh, look at FSMP training 2021. Okay, this was done earlier in FSMP and this is what we are done training and so on and so forth. Okay, now this one I want to create a backup because I want to shift it to another course. Okay, so. I will do this. I will click here and I will go back to the backup button. So this I just zoom out. So zoom here. Okay. And I have backup. Second. Okay. I'm zooming, so it's it's problem sometimes. So the Kenneth, maybe uh, you yeah, can yeah. share. <laughs> I, I just I just yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Oh sorry, sorry. I was not sharing because it's hanging. It hung again. Okay. Sorry, it was not, it was hanging. Is it visible now? Uh, coming up, I think. It's coming up, I think. Just yeah, so I shared and it's uh, hanging. <laughs> are you all, all facing the same challenge with the students when you are doing the WebEx? Yes, it is. So um, most of the student uh, they not favor on using Webex. So um, yeah, yeah. I, I I using uh, Google Meet, which is um, a little bit uh, lighter in the term of uh, yeah. data consuming and 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 the application. Mm. Wait, I have to stop sharing and reshare again. One minute. Yeah, it's lighter in terms of that. Uh, in terms of the processing power, actually, surprisingly, the WebEx will work more efficiently on a mobile phone than on the. Now I'm using desktop. Probably the mobile phone have uh, the processing power is more than the laptop and desktop. I think so. I guess so. So faster than. Okay, so I'm have to stop and sorry, I just have to stop and restart because uh, stop and sharing and restart. Usually with WebEx, the problem will start when you try to start recording the screen and simultaneously sharing. So you have to start sharing and then you record, then click the record. And now we are actually having the problem of circling. It's just going round and round. Okay, uh, reshare. It goes through this time. Okay. 
Okay, should be off. Okay, uh, Mr. Amin, sharing? Yeah, yes, yes, okay, yes. Okay, You're sorry. sharing now. Yeah, okay, so it was offline and it came online. Okay, so now this is a content which we have here, which has been done earlier. And we want to back up this. So you straight away go to this button here. I'm not going to zoom again because again it hangs. So you have here backup and restore. There's an arrow facing upward and an arrow facing downward for restore. So click here and backup. Okay, and now in the backup system, you can include everything, including the user data, or you can exclude the user data. So this is usually done at the end of the uh, last uh, week. Usually at the end of when we have fin finished all the formative assessment, we will do this. So you can include enroll user, you can exclude it. Okay, so then you have to next. It goes through multiple steps because it keeps asking you to clarify certain things and whether you want content and so on and so forth because it does not want to create unnecessary content. Now, when it creates a backup, right, it creates a file name. I would suggest you copy this file name and you paste it on a notepad so that you can use it for reference later and you don't lose uh, backups because you may do it, be doing multiple backups. You perform backup here. Now the system will perform the backup and now this particular file has got a significant amount of graphics and other stuff so it will take time to do the backup but now it's done uh, quickly because I'm in UMS. If you're off campus it may take time. Okay, So you continue and now you see the backup file here. Now the backup file is actually here. Backup Moodle dot cross dot and then it has a time and if you have copied and pasted the original one, you can actually track this here. As you can see, there are multiple backup files because I'm on the admin browser, so it will backup a lot of stuff. So I need to have that reference link or the reference handle. And then you click here, download. Okay. When you download the file, the file will be saved in your computer as a backup file in a MBZ format. Now this format is only recognized by Moodle. It will not, you cannot open it in your computer unless you are running Moodle a virtual machine in a computer. So don't try to do that because that again requires another setup. So you save it first. After I save it in the computer, I will upload it to UMS Google Drive under the folder for that semester and that's CC. So that will become the backup for me in case I need, in case everything else fails, there's still a backup there. Okay, so that's what you do. So I won't save it now. It's done. Now, when I want to restore it, restore meaning I send it back to the destination file. What you need to do is click here on the restore button. Okay. Restore. So when you do the restore, right, it will ask you again. Usually at this stage, you can eliminate the users from that. So you can remove the users from this particular backup file or you can remove them later. It's It can be done at any given point in time. But if you include your user information, what's going to happen is that your users, the previous batch will automatically get enrolled and they may get a notification. Okay, so usually we do this. Continue. Okay. Now it will ask you where to back up to. <laughs> so <coughs> usually you will have your faculty. You can search for a faculty here. Okay. Or you can uh, search by the course. So I'll, I call up my course if I'm not mistaken. It's called backup. So I just click and search. And remember that again, this is case sensitive. Okay. This one is case sensitive and sometimes if you have many courses with have a similar case, you will have to be careful with that. So I've already created here a course called backup course. Okay, This is just a general course I create. So you just click on backup and then you continue. Okay, now when you want to restore it to that course, you don't want the users of course. So you, you click on this one, unclick this. Include enrolled users, no. So all your user data, grades, everything is removed. You only have your original content. Sometimes people remove this out. This is the calendar events. For example, this is the events related to the assignments, the deadline for submission. But I would suggest don't click this because you can manually change that later on. You just remove the users. Okay. This one, of course, will not go in. Grade history will not go. Okay. This is so next. Okay. And then it asks you to override. Okay. Now I am going to override that. So I'm going to override that so you can, uh, in case you have no content, but usually at the beginning of the semester, you will have the blank, you will, it's just be a blank template. There won't be anything else. So now the user data is not there. There's section one, section two, all the user data has been removed. There's only the sections there. You go to next. You have everything here. Again, it asks you because it does its due diligence and you perform the restore. When you click perform the restore, 
it will actually go to the send all the content. So now you continue and now you can see. Okay, so you can see whatever was in the other course. See, it's come here. All these image files, everything here except the users. So in this one, there will be only some users, but you can check. So this course is people. Okay, and now this course is actually hidden. So you can click here on people. And there's nobody here in the course. Now, if I want to enroll users, I will follow the same procedure. So I have created a new course and I want to enroll the users. You need to click on the uh, enrollment users and you can do the enrollment methods just as I have taught you uh, auto enroll. I want to enroll a teacher. For example, see, I enroll a teacher. I can enroll. I have to assign a teacher. Okay. So I go to the self enrollment and I can do the assignment of the teachers. Then I, oh, I can do manual enrollment. Okay, so this is the way in which you uh, do the uh, course restoration. Okay, so you can ask your teacher, for example, you have a teacher, you can ask them to, you can, you have a co-lecturer, you can give them the course code, this particular course, backup course, you can ask them to enroll for that course. And once they enrolled, you can assign them as a teacher. So that's the simplest way to back up and restore. So this should be generally done. For example, this is the week when we started our course usually i will do it in the previous week just when the course before the course so when the students actually come in for the first week they actually have it ready to enroll okay so that's the procedure we follow now suppose i want to share this uh, into my students i will go to this course backup course i will copy this link here the i will copy the url i can send it by whatsapp to the students or to the group communication and then they will uh, click enroll Okay, so I hope that answers the um, question. Thank you very much, Dr. Kenneth. It's clear. It's very to useful clarify. and and helpful. Yeah, you need me to clarify or anything else. So it's basically when you back up, don't include the user. That's that's the thing which we need to do. Okay, so there's some. Question in the chat from uh, Why is there no option for select the collection on OER submission? Uh, oh, okay, Dr. Kaur, this is because you have been assigned only, you can only deposit under your respective faculty. I hope that clarifies it. Okay, so what I showed you here is. Um, is a admin screen, so you will see many things. So if you are assigned to a, if you are assigned to a faculty, you will only see that you can only submit to that faculty. Okay, so suppose you are having cross, for example, you are from FSMP, and then you have some collaboration with FSSA. You can deposit uh, with the lecturer from FSSA in their faculty or FSMP, but you can always give them as an author, co-author in your collection. It's entirely up to the content creator. Okay, I hope that answered the question, Dr. Kaur. Hi, hey, Dr. Ken, I was just wondering, because I was trying to uh, do mm -hmm. some, I was just trying to play around with the submissions. So mm -hmm. I, I'm clicking on the uh, submissions mm -hmm. and I click on uh, start make yeah. a new, ah, start okay. another submission. So yeah. under the collection, I, I there's, not, there's no option here. Not even nothing a for single you. option. No, nothing, nothing for me. Okay. Yeah. Have you just registered for the system now? I just think registered. I have registered for quite some time, but I okay. didn't lock okay. in and things. Okay, um, I understand. You can. Nora, yeah, Nora, you can that for you. ask Nora to add the collections. Yeah. Generally, add the collection or us? Sorry? Collections uh, are the e articles, e books, e notes, the like things that you like need this. to upload, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but you, you if you don't this. have the drop down, if you don't have the drop down, that means um, Nora hasn't set you as the submitter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm trying to refresh right now. There's still no options for me to do a submission. Uh, yeah, I'm no, trying to no, refresh no, again. Nora will do that for you now. Actually, you should see oh, this under your faculty. Thank you. Can you see now? Yeah. See, that, that, that's why we try uh, to do it during the roadshow because there are two things which you need to do. First is you need to register. So that's the first thing which Nora does. Secondly, you need to be assigned to a collection. I, so, I still can't do it. Probably I'll try a bit later. 
uh, actually should, it's a single click it should be okay i think should be able to do are you seeing any kind of uh ah yes i can do it right now all right got okay. it thank you thank you thank you nora she will do it now thank you okay anybody facing this problem then you can just uh, ask uh, miss nora she will do she has control on the system the gatekeeper <laughs> You're talking it? Yeah. And the, I can see the select a collection. Mm. Uh, I can see like uh, PP is already in there. Yeah. Can, can, can we ask uh, specific for? Sure, uh, sure, sure. For, for, for your person, right? Yeah, yeah, can, can. Nora can create. It's a, it's a, Nora can create, right? It's a yeah. one step because the admin can create. It's just creating an instance. Uh, Dr. Dennis, actually, this is all, uh, these are actually folders, you know, we just create an additional folder for you. Huh. Sorry about that. We didn't, we miss out because it should be actually there inside, but. As more and more unit and Pusat add, right? We have to yeah. update the system. If I is already put the new faculties. Uh, let's check. Huh? F I S. Uh, I could leave. I have to check. Okay, okay. Let's see. Huh? Yes. And that's Ada. Ada, yeah. They are adding uh, based on. That's why we do the roadshow. If it's not there immediately, we will uh, add add up some of them. So F I S F I S. I give the English version of our my my center. Okay, okay. Please give to Nora, uh, Doctor Dennis. We will do immediately. So you want the same set of categories, right? E article, ebook, e brochure, and so on. You can give her the categories uh -huh. if you have anything beyond that. So these are the ones which are there. So this is a good one stop place for all the content. So you can have your bulletins and your notes and everything else. So anyone else, they don't have to keep asking you where is the link, where is the link? You just say refer to this. Basically, whatever we do, right? In PEP, we upload here. So it remains on the record. So even if we are not here, other people can use it. <laughs> okay. Nora can do, right? <clears throat> How do I contact Nora? <laughs> okay, okay. No, Nora is there online. <laughs> That's why we do when we are online, we are here to help you. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah, we try to, uh, uh, in FSAP, we try to actually to promote OER and MOOC, but uh, of course, uh, some people that they will not fully understand, can, once they understand the, how important it is, they might eager to actually submit the articles on it. Yeah, yeah you just tell them it will come in their Google Scholar. <laughs> it shows up on the Google Scholar. If you, if you link it, if you use the right keyword, right, you must use the right keyword. You use exactly yeah. the keyword as used in your in your publication, and then it will come uh -huh. with your metadata in the Google Scholar, or you can edit manually because this is actually a link which is accessible globally. It's like a DOI number. Okay. Earlier, I also tried to get a handle, you know, says a handle registration, but currently not done as yet. Is hand, handle registration means it will come like a DOI to the respective link to the respective publication. Dr. Kenneth, I am yep. just wondering, do people upload student thesis in OER as well? Uh, or they upload the library? No, Dr. Kaur, we cannot upload the student thesis here because that's the IP of the UMS library. Uh, assignment you can upload here. There are, for example, oh. if you go to the some of the faculties, you will see the assignments here. Oh, okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Sorry, I got notification. It's noisy. Sorry. Any other questions? Sorry, the uh, notification from the computer very noisy.
के आई थिंक नोरा इज अटेंडिंग टू दैट डू यू हैव एनी फर्दर क्वेश्चन और वी कैन एंड द सेशन You can just ask me, no problem. Just turn on your microphone. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, I was yeah, just yeah, wondering. Uh, the recording will be shared later, right? Yeah, yeah Doctor Asma. Actually, okay. what happens? Right, we will share a recording with you. But if you have any problem, if you want a instant solution, right? Means suppose you want to address, you can actually go to our UMS, the uh, our uh, Center for E-Learning. You can go to the website actually, and then there's a manual there. The system manual is in the system. So suppose you have a specific question related to that, the answer is there in one um, in one uh, go. You don't like an infographic, okay? All right, that's amazing. Because you All have right. to watch the whole video, and then, <laughs> then it's a PEP, MSP. Oh, yeah. so just okay. go to the MSP, PEP, PEP, MS, and then you will find the answer there. You can go to the downloads. Okay, so publication here. And then you oh, can yes. get here. So these are here. So if your students have problem, you can give it to them. There's a students learning with technology student guide, and there's one for lecturers here. All right. So, okay. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Okay. Also, many of the uh, doctor, uh, this one, uh, uh, Mr. Hafizi actually has made very good material. Okay. On he also has posted it. Mr. Hafizi's material is there as well, and then he has created some infographics. Okay. We can share with you. I think he shares it with the e-learning coordinators. Very good material. One click. <laughs> okay, thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or we, uh, I stopped sharing. So the, the system is hanging. <coughs> Can we have a photograph? If you all don't mind, whoever wants to be photographed, we just uh, photograph. Nora will take the photograph. So everyone is in the office. <laughs> so Nora, can you please, uh, take the photograph for the record? Just for a while. Most of us are in, back in the office, right? <laughs> Whatever, taking Ambar. Okay. Okay, Nora, one, two, three. Yeah, I just click on. Huh? Eugenia, can you click or is Nora taking the picture? Snap. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to thank on behalf of the Center for E-Learning, I would like to thank each and every one of our respected academic staff for attending this uh, roadshow and briefing. Uh, please be uh, sure that we are here to help you. If you have any problem, you can always contact our help desk. We will try our best to help you. And we apologize for any of the shortcomings on our behalf because sometimes the system <laughs> response in a way in which we can't really react to, you know, they sometimes some problems, so we have to refer back to JTMK. Okay, so thank you very much. I wish you a very good day and uh, please stay safe. Prima Kasi. Thank you very much, Dr. Kenneth uh, and PEP. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah, stay safe.